find out. I agree that it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we'll, we can have you do that at the background, uh, Satya, but we can yes, move on. Sir. Please, sir. Uh, so uh, can we see uh, Paolo's uh, video as well as... Uh, uh, yeah, so we are on the gallery view. <laughs> so I have to... Uh, we're all deeply honored, privileged, and uh, uh, thankful for the fact that Paolo Ferrero, uh, who works at the epicenter of uh, the COVID infection, he has joined us. He's been very kind enough to, amidst, I'm sure, so many other distractions and so many challenges to have come forth and uh, participated in this uh, rather remarkably successful webinar series that we've put together. Uh, and I'm sure we will be enriched and uh, wiser uh, in, in managing our patients and perhaps sometimes our own selves after hearing this uh, experience. So over to Paolo. Thank, thank you very much. I'm, uh, thank you for inviting me, for involving me in this uh, uh, important uh, initiative. Um, uh, I'm very pleased and I hope to share with you some useful information from the side of patients and also uh, congenital heart disease specialists. Uh, I, would, I would like just to go back to 21st of February when all the history started in Italy. So at that time we were just working uh, as a usual day in our hospital that you can see here in the, in the first slide. And uh, at the time we started to hear about the first patient that was admitted in the nearby hospital uh, with, uh, with um, ascertained COVID infection. The same day, we, we had the first case in our hospital as well, uh, but we didn't imagine the, the disaster that uh, would have come up. Uh, the following week, this was the situation in our hospital. So we started to, uh, hear the, the silence of ambulance coming to the hospital and to uh, see the fear, the concern in the eyes of our colleagues. And we realized that something unusually but very scary was going on. So immediately the, the, the hospital was turned out in a COVID hospital. So all the ordinary activity was completely washed out. We had to face many, so many patients coming to the hospital. So the intensivist had to decide what patient had the priority to be intubated. So it was a really disaster from the emotional point of view as well. So at that time, based on the initial data, we thought that uh, in particular pediatric patients were not eaten by this virus. Now thing has changed, but uh, we, uh, and to this regard, probably our epidemiology is a little bit different from yours because uh, our major concern was initially uh, about adult congenital disease because our center is doing uh, um, cardiac surgery since 1969. So we have a lot of grown out patients uh, with a lot of issues, even with uh, uh, very poor conditions, cyanotic patients and so on. Uh, this is a, is a picture that properly had made the round of the world. It is. Uh, uh, scanning picture showing a, a long queue of uh, uh, military trucks bringing the bodies. This is Bergamo, where I live, bringing the bodies uh, to the cremator crematoria. And I have to say that uh, this was on 9th of April. I have to say that uh, um, one in four of uh, all the deaths in Italy are from Lombardy. And uh, particularly Bergamo was particularly hit. And uh, this means that uh, um, almost an entire generation probably will disappear from our head. And, and this figure probably is underestimated. They will go uh, in, to this topic even uh, also later because many patients are not even tested because they are at home, they're elderly and they die at home. So probably the number is uh, is huge and is much higher than we uh, currently estimate. This has some relevance for our patient, in particular for pediatric patient as well, as I will um, explain later. Uh, so, but we are still uh, 
congenital disease, especially pediatric joy. So even if the, 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 the hospital was uh, fully devoted to the care of COVID patient, uh, we had some concern about uh, our patient, in particular adult, because uh, uh, what we, we know now is a little bit different uh, uh, from what uh, was our perception of the risk initially. So initially we thought that uh, pediatric patients were not, uh, was not a relevant issue for, for pediatric patients, for congenital patients, pediatric with, uh, with kids with congenital uh, problems. Uh, now we know, definitely know, uh, some data came up from China, from Spain as well, and we will show, I will show later, uh, that definitely there are cases in, uh, in kids and uh, in, uh, in the pediatric population. In particular, we have no data about uh, the epidemio real epidemiology of congenital patients because most of them are advised to stay at home so they are not tested. And uh, what I'm going to say is based uh, is, uh, based on a sort of survey that I did for home when I was, uh, I was calling every patient because at that time there was a, the, the, our perception was that for any patient this would have been a complete disaster. So I started to call the patient and I realized that uh, some of them got the infection but uh, surprisingly they were doing well. So I, uh, uh, keep uh, kept on with this uh, with this survey, trying to advise the patient to stay at home, to avoid any contact with the hospital. So the the the, the main uh, the the main uh, concern and the main focus of our job at that time was try to get some data about stratification of the risk, how to reorganize the care, and this is different for, uh, from uh, adult pediatric patient because we know that. Uh, Adult congenital most of the procedure, even surgery, are elective, but uh, uh, it's a different story for that because there are still urgency and uh, we have to manage this. Uh, the, the, I mentioned before the, the problem of, of the diagnosis. Uh, we know data now uh, tell us that the sensitivity is around 70% of the test. PCR with the swab, uh, of the sensitivity, the yield of the test in the application is probably even lower. Uh, we have the problem of patient management, so we canceled all the outpatient clinic with, and we uh, counseled the, the advice the patient to stay at home and uh, we try to, to keep on some follow with some follow up uh, by by the phone. And we apply, of course, all the, uh, in terms of uh, prevention, we apply all the, the usual uh, recommendations, of social distancing, uh, avoid contact with the hospital and so on. And again, for the pediatric population, there is less evidence about this. That we don't have a, a precise track of the contact in, in kids and so on. Uh, so, the, uh, as I said, uh, particular for the pediatric patient, we are, there are still uh, urgency to, to manage, and I will uh, show an example uh, later. And the policy of our uh, uh, department, our region, or our government, was to centralize the, the, the care. Uh, here is this picture is the, the, our region, which is Lombardy. You can see Milan and Bergamo, which are the biggest uh, center, uh, pediatric center, and uh, the uh, San Rafael, which is Milan, was uh, uh, designated as a hub center for adult, not congenital, but for adult. San Donato, where uh, Mario Carminati works, uh, was designated as a hub center uh, for uh, um, uh, congenital, uh, congenital procedure and so on. So, uh, Bergamo was uh, dedicated to, to, to COVID and uh, we tried to centralize the, the, also the urgency to the other, to the other center. Carlo, can you please uh, increase your audio and then uh, close the door because some surrounding noise is coming. You can, uh, that is okay, you can just increase your audio or come to the computer. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, now Much. it is very good. Thank you. Much better. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, so as I, as I said, uh, initially our focus was uh, more on uh, grown-up patient, uh, which means after 14 years old and, uh, and uh, all the, the good patient. And uh, we set up uh, together with the colleague in San Donato, uh, set up a protocol to uh, carry on with the follow-up of this patient. And uh, the concept was to minimize exposure of uh, um, of a patient to the, the hospital uh, and uh, to man at the same time to maintain a high level of medical and psychological support for uh, for uh, for patient and their families we divided the patient our uh, patient in follow up in two uh, in three um, in three category of risk low risk intermediate and high i will not go into many details but we plan a different schedule of uh, telephonic follow-up for each category of, uh, of risk. These are the results of a survey of about uh, um, 500 patients. Now we are end up with, uh, I, we have the data about, uh, um, for about uh, 600 patients. These, uh, ref these uh, uh, refer to adult patients and grown-up patients, young adult and uh, uh, adolescent patients. So you can see here that uh, uh, we prioritize patients with more complex conditions. And on the right hand of the screen, you can see that we found a lot of patients uh, with specific symptoms. By specific symptoms, I mean a combination of uh, uh, fever, cough, um, loss of uh, smell and taste, which is very, very specific. And this despite a low uh, percentage of uh, uh, diagnosis with, with the test. Only two patients out of our population, now we are four patients. So four patients uh, out of our population were positive, but a lot had definite symptoms, uh, were not hospitalized, and they had probably the infection. So this is, was the first good news because we found a lot of congenital patients at home without, uh, uh, with mild symptoms uh, with, without a severe presentation. They did not uh, require any hospitalization. This is the same, uh, the 90 patients that we found uh, uh, symptomatic, so likely with infection, that we kept at home as outpatient divided for the different category of uh, underlying anatomy and physiology. We also had the uh, univentricular patient uh, with, uh, with, with symptom and uh, also very complex patient, as you can see in, in this slide. So what we did was, uh, as I said, uh, comply to the principle to keep the patient, to keep the patient away from the hospital, to counsel the patient at home and to keep the, the home, uh, uh, to keep patient at home by liaising with the general practitioner and to uh, just advise him and to try to monitor symptoms and saturation uh, remotely. Uh, you can see here that uh, we have a, a protocol in place in our, in our hospital, in our uh, department, uh, which uh, contemplate to start hydroxychloroquine, which is a an anti-malarian uh, medication and azithromycin in selected cases. This is not a guidance, but we saw that uh, according to preliminary data that is uh, protecting the, the, the lung from more severe presentation. Um, only to patient and need to escalate the, 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 the medication and the, the, the care and they had to be admitted. One patient was, uh, and both patients were uh, discharged, uh, were improved, one with mild symptoms, uh, the other one with more severe symptoms, but fortunately we could manage to win from uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation and is now ready to, to be uh, discharged. I will spend the rest of my presentation to, to um, just to give some uh, emblematic example. Uh, this is another patient uh, with uh, um, post uh, atrial switch, so this population, of course, uh, older population, those that uh, had undergone atrial switch, 
uh, and this just to underline the importance to keep the patient away from the hospital. So uh, on the 1st of March, he, he went to the uh, uh, A&E because of atrial fibrillation. That hospital was at the center of the storm and already 90, 84 uh, notified patients were uh, in, the, in, in our area at that time. After one week, he started to have uh, um, uh, back pain. Uh, he undergone a CT that revealed the interstitial pneumonia, but he, he had very, very specific symptoms, no severe symptoms. Uh, he was hospitalized, he didn't need any uh, specific medication, no oxygen, and he was discharged a few days. So this was the first good news, so a very complicated patient uh, that was uh, successfully discharged. This is another patient, opposite, uh, same anatomy, but uh, uh, opposite presentation. And I would like, just going back to the previous slide, to underline that this patient was, was fit, BMI was normal. This patient had uh, a completely different presentation, same anatomy, gain atrial switch, um, the same range of age, a little bit older. Uh, he needed to uh, sip up, so non invasive ventilation. Uh, and we started again uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. In, and we uh, started a trial of high dose steroids, which is another, uh, another observation that uh, we had. So many patients that uh, go towards. Uh, uh, I, uh, severe lung disease improve, uh, can improve with uh, immunosuppression, immunomodulation, high dose of uh, steroids. Uh, uh, this patient also was lucky, so we are able to weed from CPAP to taper steroids, and he's now ready to be discharged. <clears throat> this is an intermediate presentation, so Again, same anatomy, complex patient, quite old, uh, and uh, he had. Uh, I called him at home in, during my survey. Reported uh, cough and fever. Uh, we started this medication according to our local protocol, but despite this, uh, the cough and uh, was not settling. So. I brought him quickly to the hospital for a chest X-ray for an hemogas analysis. Chest X-ray was fine, uh, saturation was fine, and he was discharged. I put together this, this case just to underline the probably the complexity <coughs> and the uh, underlying anatomy is not that important, mm -hmm. but what matter is the um, general, uh, is the uh, general risk factor that are now recognized among the general population, uh, uh, namely uh, gender, age, uh, BMI, diabetes, uh, and uh, bad lifestyle, and, and, and so on. For the pediatrics, it's a completely different history. As I said, initially, we, we assumed that uh, the pediatric population was not that involved in this infection. Now we know that probably is not the case, but uh, still, the, uh, at least in our experience, uh, the, 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 ca the um, case with severe presentation are not, uh, is not that high. I just uh, present uh, uh, data from the literature. These are not uh, related to congenital. I don't think that are specific data on congenital um, uh, for congenital patient. And uh, this is a report from China. This is a very, uh, this just came up yesterday, a report from Spain, which is uh, in Europe uh, at the center of the storm like Italy. You can see that the incidence uh, of uh, positive patient below, um, below 18 years old in Madrid is less than 1%. Uh, again, again, the, the um, yield of the test is low, only uh, around 10% positive. It's very difficult to track contact in this patient. Uh, probably uh, the infection, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the infection is not that related with, with, with the contact. In this case, it's difficult to track the contact of this patient. 10% were admitted to the ICU. 10% uh, needed oxygen support and uh, no death in this, in this, uh, in this uh, case series. 
I will uh, present uh, some of our cases that uh, in somehow represent the category of patient that you can see this refer to pediatric population. Uh, the, the categories of patient that we can see and uh, I will underline some all mark there are some all mark that we learned that are very characteristic of this patient. This is a patient with normal heart, so we start saying we we start seeing patient with normal heart come with, with this uh, typical syndrome. So prodromic syndrome, gastrointestinal fever, uh, lymphadenitis, and at the beginning this was the presentation very suggestive of uh, Kawasaki so uh, fever not uh, not unremitting fever for many days, uh, poorly responding to paracetamol. So the patient came to the pediatric department. Uh, ACG showed the sinus tachycardia, but uh, the ACG was, uh, was not normal uh, with low voltages and prolonged QT um, and slight desaturation. It was treated with uh, immunoglobulin because uh, uh, the, uh, also the echocardiography showed uh, hyperechogenic, not dilated, but hyperechogenic coronary. So the, in the hypothesis, the diagnosis was uh, uh, Kawasaki. Uh, he uh, started uh, immunoglobulin, high dose, uh, and some diuretic. We also used uh, low molecular weight heparin because we learned that this uh, COVID-19 is, uh, is uh, very thrombogenic. This patient was positive at the test. Uh, uh, with the, this medication, with this therapy, the fever settled, uh, but after a few days, it started to have this saturation. We did a uh, chest X-ray, which is not shown here. Uh, so we went for a CT that showed the, some interstitial changes and also some consolidation. Uh, I will uh, talk about chest X-ray again. So chest X-ray is not that uh, reliable, not that sensitive in, uh, in this patient, particularly in, uh, in, uh, in con not only in a patient with normal heart, but also in congenital patient with operated condition or with uh, congenital problem. And because, of course, there is the problem of that, uh, differential diagnosis with uh, failure, we will uh, talk about this later. Uh, so these are in the right panel, these are the lab test. So this condition is characterized by elevated inflammatory uh, parameters, in particular D-dimer and uh, troponin uh, CRP. And all this patient has sign of uh, uh, myocardial injury. And you can see here the, 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 uh, the SCG. ACG is very important to, uh, to do an ACG in this, this patient because of many, uh, because often there is an involvement, you can see by troponin, and, but also the, the, the ACG is useful in this patient, quite sensitive, you can see the low, uh, the reducing, the reduced voltages and this sort of uh, uh, fragmentation of the QRS, which uh, at least in our experience, uh, also in other, uh, other patients, not with COVID, but in, uh, with myocarditis, we found that sometimes you can see this uh, fragmentation in the SCG. This is another patient, uh, uh, most the same uh, age, similar presentation. So diarrhea, uh, fever, um, ejection fraction a little bit in the lower range, uh, range for, uh, the, for a female uh, of uh, seven years, seven year. uh, sinus tachycardia, normal saturation, normal chest ray, but again, a high, very sky high level of uh, inflammatory uh, index. The DCG, well, the first DCG just was shown at the beginning sinus tachycardia, but later on we the following day, we observed the reduction in the voltage and again, some kind of fragmentation of QRS. And at that time, we performed another echo and the uh, ejection pressure uh, went down to 40, 35, 40%. This is just to show you what we mean by uh, fragmentation. This is a, a research letter we, we published uh, last year, uh, a correlation of uh, uh, this, uh, this sign with uh, late gadolinium enhancement on the 
uh, MRI. I think that this is something that we have uh, to keep in mind because uh, when you suspect uh, uh, myocarditis, and uh, uh, at least in our experience, uh, we saw many patients with uh, uh, many patients. Uh, up to now, four patients are, came to the hospital with positive test, a certain test, but all of them had some kind of uh, myocardial injury, in particular patient with uh, normal heart. So in patient with normal heart, we don't see many lung presentation, at least from the symptoms and from the chest X-ray, but almost invariably we can see some degree of myocardial involvement. So in this patient, it's very important to perform and to see very accurately the ECG because sometimes you can have clue. We know that it's difficult to perform MRI, to perform a biopsy in kids, so ECG can be useful. This is a congenital patient. Uh, you will post uh, a mail for months uh, multiple VSD, post PA bending, again, prodromal symptoms were fever and gastrointestinal, very common gastrointestinal symptoms uh, as a first presentation. Echocardiography was, uh, was uh, a change, was not different from the, the usual, uh, so the, what we expect in this kind of anatomy. Uh, SEG sinus tachycardia, uh, saturation 90%, chest is ray just minor interstitial thickening, but I think that is related to the fact that the radiologist was seeing all the day patient with COVID, but I think it's very difficult to, to even make a differential diagnosis. If you see this patient with this heart, for example, if you know that he has a BSD, you may think that he's just a fellow or, uh, or uh, hypercirculation and so on. So, uh, the, in our experience, uh, chest is raised, not, is not helpful, so we have a low threshold for CT in this patient. And again, the, the ECG can give some clues, but of course, uh, differently from patients with normal heart, uh, we can have changes in the QRS, changes in the voltages and uh, repolarization because of the previous surgeries. But again, we, there was uh, some uh, elevation of troponin. This is a patient, as I mentioned before, we still have to face with, uh, with uh, urgency. This is a patient that came actually to the hospital, is a four month patient, unbalanced a VSD with hypoplastic uh, left ventricle, so it went uh, univentricular palliation with Amos K and Arch repair. Um, and uh, he came to the hospital because of heart failure, basically. And you can see here that was a sign of recortation. He was uh, tested because we test almost all patients that come to the hospital because for urgency, as I said, we have to send the patient in another hospital. In this case, we, need, we treated the patient with a stent in our hospital because there was not bed available in the other hospital. Uh, the presentation was an actual presentation of heart failure, so with congestion and so on. So we don't know if the, the, uh, the swab, the COVID is just a bystander in this case. So just to make the picture a li little bit more complicated because we have to take into account that this patient can come with heart failure then and the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 is something that can be just a bystander because we know that in pediatric population, uh, many infections are uh, asymptomatic or something that the patient gets in the hospital. Uh, and so it's difficult to make a difference, differential diagnosis in this case. Uh, I try to summarize what is our behavior and what we observe. So up to now, uh, only four patients came to the hospital. We have a, a network with uh, the nearby hospital that refer patient to us, but uh, I don't have any uh, mention of uh, patient uh, in follow-up uh, with repair or unrepair uh, condition uh, with, with bad infection. So the typical presentation is, uh, is a little bit different in, in kids as compared to adults. So gastrointestinal is very common, fever. Uh, all, always we, we see very high level of uh, the dimer and the inflammatory ferritin and also other inflammatory markers. Uh, no severe respiratory involvement unless uh, there is a, 
uh, underlying condition of heart failure. And so in that case, probably the COVID-19 is something that uh, add on top or even a bystander. For normal heart, uh, we saw this association of uh, COVID-19 with Kawasaki. So after the, that first case that I showed, other two cases of Kawasaki came to the hospital. I don't know if it was a, a, uh, an association, but the, the presentation was a typical because uh, we saw also uh, uh, lung uh, disease, uh, some interstitial, interstitial changes that we were able to pick up only with, uh, uh, only with uh, CT. Uh, so myocarditis, uh, the full myocarditis or mild degree of myocardial involvement is very common, very common. And uh, so we have to high, a high threshold to uh, uh, look for this in the ECG, in the, in the troponin, the markers, and so on. Uh, and uh, the test about the diagnosis started uh, saying that the, the sensitivity is low, probably is even lower in the in the in pediatric population uh, and uh, so we have to rely on clinical presentation so we have to consider uh, in this period uh, all positive patient, uh, infected patient according to the, the clinical presentation and uh, we need to have a low threshold to perform CT probably because it's difficult to make a differential diagnosis uh, is particularly important for patients with congenital problem. So just to sum up, to conclude, uh, as I said, uh, probably the, the, in your country the epidemiology is a bit different because you see much more cases of uh, uh, congenital heart disease in kids. Your numbers are huge compared to ours, but according to our uh, experience, we confirm that uh, the, the, the symptomatic disease in uh, children in, in prevalence is uh, quite low. We don't see many uh, severe lung presentation. Our uh, concern is more about uh, uh, grown up and adult and all, some old patients even that uh, survived to previous surgery are now adult. But uh, differently what we, what we, uh, from what we initially expected, so a disaster in this patient, then we don't have mortality so far. So what is important is to keep social distancing, to keep all the recommendations also for this patient, which is uh, very effective. And uh, probably the complexity of the anatomy is not very important. It doesn't matter in uh, making the risk. What matters is uh, other comorbidities that also uh, congenital heart disease, also congenital patient can have, so obesity, uh, poor fitness, and so on. Very important to use technologies in this period. We all the time call patients at home. We try to keep them away from the hospital. We have a couple of patients with pulmonary, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension that are at home with uh, post, uh, postanoid infusion. Uh, we, we call uh, them uh, every day and uh, the parents give us uh, the, the parameter and uh, so far they are doing well. So I think that according to our experience, the, 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 the news from congenital patients are quite good. So even patients, even grown out patients, all patients with very bad condition, with very complex anatomy, uh, if they comply with the recommendation and uh, even if they get infected, they can have uh, uh, manageable uh, presentation at home without uh, uh, without hospitalization. This is last slide. Just to, this is the p a picture which is in front of our hospital, and uh, just a few words uh, in memory of the uh, huge number of doctors that uh, and uh, also nurses that uh, healthcare professionals in general that uh, lost their life uh, because of their job uh, in, uh, during this pandemic in Italy. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, we uh, are again most thankful for this extraordinary education. Uh, we've uh, learned a lot, and I think uh, uh, in a very short time you've uh, presented uh, the picture. Uh, we have some uh, questions that I'll try and moderate because our moderator for today is busy in the hospital, and uh, Nageshwar has requested me to moderate. Uh, and I would request the other panelists to join in uh, if they have any questions. 
but you, i'll start with questions right away you uh, have dr majni alvi there you yes. can uh, actually Hi, can you dr. see uh, radha krishnan sir also there as a panelist yeah okay. can you uh, 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 show the video of dr majni as well now i'll quickly go on to the questions because uh, i will limit the questions because there are too many of them but mm-hmm. i will limit it to the context of congenital heart disease and uh, to some extent children mm-hmm. uh, the question that has come from babar hasan is in a normal heart uh, in which the suspicion of chd is low can one not avoid echocardiography if one can get bnp troponin and ekg uh, changes uh, and 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 covid uh, testing uh, that's the question because i think the concern then is to you know have these patients come into the general populace okay yes so um we we were a little bit worried about uh, some patient coming with this this presentation so we started to have a, a low threshold to investigate uh, this patient to find if there was some uh, myocardial involvement of course uh, um if you have a negative troponin negative market uh, probably that, that that's that's it's enough normal ecg uh, so on uh what i can uh, say that sometimes the uh, worsening of the uh, the, the projection fraction is, is quite quick so you, I, i show that uh, the first patient uh, the second patient came with uh, little bit lower ejection fraction and the same the following day the ejection fraction was around 30 so um this is something that we have to monitor uh and for this initial for example if the patient goes to not not in, in a cardiological environment um but definitely probably uh, i i would add the screen for uh troponin in, in this period for patient that came with symptoms suggestive of covid infection uh, so there's another question which says please elaborate on the echo protocol with personal protective equipment for covid positive or suspected patient who comes in the outpatient with the general clinic yes uh, uh, we, we 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 don't have a specific protocol what we we have in uh, in, uh, in place in our hospital is a uh, Uh, a separate pathway so patient that came to the ani uh, for adult, adult and uh, pediatric uh, if they have suspected symptoms comes to a sort of dirty place a dirty section of the ani in which you have to everything you do there has to be protected we have uh, guns and uh, protection and uh, uh, we use uh, uh, an echo machine that is uh, Uh, clean uh, after every patient so we have a low threshold to uh, centralize patient with suspect pediatric and adult with suspected uh, covid even like only according to the clinical presentation to a specific room uh, and in that room there is a high level of protection for the operator and uh, with mask with the ppe and so on and that same applies to the one patient that you had to catheterize to do the stenting as well i suppose yeah yes yeah even uh, this because uh, for example in our hospital we do also general cardio adult cardiology so we have hub for the the stemi for the myocardial infarctions so also patient that come from the other hospital with uh, st elevation and so come to this pathway which is highly protected and uh, Uh, everything is clean up after the procedure and is it easy to catheterize with ppe on is that, that that's a disaster because i think that the, uh, um, the most uh, challenging thing is to uh, maintain a high level of safety and uh, accuracy for the patient in this condition is really difficult uh, if you see a patient in the ini and you request an ecg it becomes very very difficult because everything has to be done so the 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 personnel uh, the healthcare personnel is become very stressed about this because uh, because also we we learned about many nurses that got infection so they are very very stressed so everything has to be is very is very challenging even also in the in the cat lab we also we did only one case so far because as i said according to the policy of the government we we are uh, obliged to 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 centralize patient to another hospital Uh, we did only that urgency but all the other uh, elective cut of course are cancelled and, and all the other 
urgency are uh, surgeries are centralized to another hospital. But fortunately, I, um, from to my knowledge, uh, even the other hospital hadn't any any urgent procedures so far. Uh, so we'll shift gears. There's a, lots of questions on low molecular yeah. weight heparin. Yeah. Uh, Keke, would you like to ask uh, Majini, can you go to your uh, full screen or uh, gallery view? Then he will be seen there. Yes, I can see him as We have unmuted Dr. Majini and Dr. Borakan. Uh, uh, you, no. you unmute him. No, yes. I think you, you have to unmute uh, Dr. Majini because he still stays muted as far as I can see on the screen. He's waving, which I can wave back to him. Uh, but uh, yes, now he's now, he's, uh, yeah, he's yeah. unmuted now. He's okay now. So, yeah. Masni, we would like your comments. It's an honor to have you with us. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Nagiswara and GK. And again, I'm very happy to see and hear Dr. Ferrer's talk. It's my sympathy for the people of Italy for the tragic experience they're going through right now. But everyone else is also facing the same problem, maybe not the same accident. Uh, yes, Dr. Ferrer, I'd just like to ask a, a question with regards to patients who have primary hypertension. You mentioned that at the end with regards to the two patients, but none of them so far had required uh, admission for uh, cure the coronavirus. No, the, 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 the two patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, uh, fortunately, they were at home. Uh, the father of one of the patients got infected, so we isolated. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, the, it was, uh, the, he was isolated, but uh, fortunately, the, the, the uh, the, the, his son remain asymptomatic. It is a case of very, um, uh, very complex patient with a, a high degree of pulmonary hypertension with poor radiative function. So uh, we, we were also planning to go for POTS in the, mm -hmm. in the patient. Uh, so very, very, we are very scared about the possibility that this uh, uh, patient uh, could have. Uh, uh, that infection, but fortunately was managed at home. Uh, even the, the the management of the line for the post was perfectly managed. There are nurses that uh, go sometimes at home to, to, to check, and uh, fortunately it is doing well uh, so far. Thank you. Okay, okay, you might want to go through the to the other questions. That yeah, so the other questions that. relate to the use of low molecular weight heparin. Uh, so the, a variety of questions. One is one question says, do you give low molecular weight to all admitted patients? Uh, if uh, um, when they have symptoms, uh, definite symptoms with uh, uh, some lung infection, uh, they have fever, they are in bed. We we and we need to start the medication. Uh, we also start low molecular weight heparin because we lost some patients that were recovering uh, with uh, pulmonary embolism. So even we, I, I have two patients that are following at home, two fellow patients, uh, uh, young adults uh, with um, uh, cough and, and fever, and uh, at least, for, at least the, 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 uh, for all the period of the, the symptomatic period, uh, I maintain with uh, low molecular heparin. Uh, so one question relates to the use of CT. Uh, so CT has poses the same kind of hazards to other parts of the hospital environment. So uh, Usha from Jaydeva asks, uh, why CT? Uh, uh, when... Well, the, the, as I said, um, the, the different from congenital to, 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 um, to adult. Let's start from, uh, from adult, even not congenital, for uh, what is the policy of our hospital. Now, uh, as we know that uh, uh, swab, the test has a low sensitivity in case of uh, um, su su suggestive symptoms. Uh, and this is a common policy, it, it become, uh, it's becoming a common policy in, in all our area, in, all, uh, in, the, in our region, many hospital uh, go for uh, CT. Of course, the, 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 the radiological department is prepared to do that. This is very challenging. There is a lot, a lot of, uh, of uh, exam that, has to, that they have to manage, but uh, we, we saw so many patients, I'm talking just about the general population, so many patients with uh, 
cough normal or even mild symptoms, only fever that they have interstitial pneumonia on the CT. Because another hallmark is that uh, some patients have desaturation with, uh, with no dyspnea and uh, we found interstitial changes. So the, the policy has changed a little bit to prioritize uh, CT in this patient. Of course, this, this problem, so the machine is almost dedicated to, the, to, the, to this patient. Uh, for the pediatric, of course, uh, up to now the cases are very, very low, but again, uh, we almost, when we have symptoms and there are some uh, suggestions that the patient can have uh, this disease, we, we go for, uh, for CT. Another question relates to fetal echocardiography in pregnant women. Are you still doing them? No, and if we will stop the clinic because uh, as the, the patient, uh, they, they go they are under the care of uh, San Donato, they do the, the prenatal assessment and they, uh, even the, 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 the mother is admitted in, in the other hospital just to limit the movement of patients. There are a lot of questions related to hydroxychloroquine. Yes. So, uh, what is your experience? Do you see any improvement when yes. using the hydroxychloroquine or is it only prophylaxis? Uh, yes, uh, this is very important because uh, um, at the beginning we just were uh, giving, uh, even the, our infectologist were just giving randomly uh, antiviral agents and so on. Then some evidence came up that uh, probably the initial uh, two antiviral, which was uh, lopinavir and ritonavir, were not that effective. There is a paper on New England stating that it's not changing the, the, the outcome of the patient, so we are most stopping to do that. Uh, while there are some uh, trials uh, ongoing, but according to our experience, hydroxychloroquine and uh, the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin is quite effective at least in uh, prevent to avoid uh, very bad lung presentation. Of course, uh, it's not giving uh, as the guidance and it is not uh, solid data, but this is our experience, it's quite effective. So we are even using at home, uh, there's a protocol from the GP as well that uh, they start uh, this medication at home and uh, uh, talking uh, Paolo, can you just uh, give one word? Hydroxychloroquine can be take prophylactic healthcare professional A. B, still should we start uh, hydroxychloroquine to patients with COVID? That uh, we want to very clear on. The patient is already on the, on, on the therapy. Patient it, came oh, with uh, COVID, would you like to start chloroquine? If, if, if not, if he's already taking, not. Not taking. He's already for not taking. Not taking. If, if you mean if a patient is taking, the, uh, is already taking the doxycycline or not? No. When patient comes to you with the COVID yes. and the heart disease, should we start chloroquine? Yes or no? Yes, I think so. yes. That, that's we, we we do we do systematically. Okay. We, we we do systematically. That, that's uh, all patient we suspect. We, we give a trial of five to seven okay. days, and then we stop. Uh, Varakan, uh, do you have any questions? Can you unmute Varakan's microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paolo, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank um, you. Again, my, my heart felt to you and your team. Uh, very dedicated time. Um, so hopefully they will pass um, very, very soon. So um, very, very interesting that you mentioned about Kawasaki disease like a, a typical KD in, in this particular group of patients and children. So in your experience, how many cases you have? Only one or, or like how many? So I didn't hear you very well. Can you repeat? Because there was some problem with my computer. Sorry. Hello? Can, can you hear me now? Yes, better. Okay. Yeah, so um, because um, you, you mentioned about a typical Kawasaki disease. Yes, uh, yes. So in your experience, how many cases? Only one or like... Oh. After that case that I presented, uh, as I said, I, I, I don't know if it was just uh, the play of chance, but we admitted to other cases mm -hmm. uh, with typical presentation, with not uh, that typical coronary involvement, but very typical presentation <laughs> with all the other criteria that responded very quickly to immunoglobulin. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but it was a typical in the, in the way that we saw also uh, some lung changes. 
Mm. Uh, so there was this kind of association of, of patient presented, and uh, probably I, I don't have any pathophysiological yeah. explanation, but there were definitely typical presentation. And in the, all these cases, there was uh, a more cardiac involvement. So mm. reduction, reduction okay. fraction, troponin, and so on. All right. Radha, sir, do you have any questions? Radha, sir, can we unmute to Radha, sir? Um, you, I noticed one of your patients received immunoglobulin. Yes. Was this the same patient whom you suspected atypical Kawasaki or whether it was for myocarditis? No, no, just the, 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 we gave immunoglobulin in uh, the, the patient with suspected Kawasaki, then we have another patient with uh, more, with a picture more uh, to, towards the myocarditis, it also use immunoglobulin as a medication for myocarditis, yes. So, uh, so far there are three patients, two with, uh, the, two, the, three patients with uh, Kawasaki presentation and one patient with uh, uh, just uh, micro, probably myocarditis. I want just to go back about the previous uh, uh, question about uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine. I want just to clarify that we give hydroxychloroquine not as a prophylaxis. So only patient with symptoms. Because they are not, they are not evidence as prophylaxis. So patient with symptoms as a medication, not as a prophylaxis. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Shiva, would you like to have any question? So, uh, I, I was listening to Dr. Paolo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paolo, for uh, coming live with us. Uh, if, I, if I understand correctly, any child, whoever is presenting with a clear-cut feature suggestive of pneumonia, like rapid breathing, fever, some amount of significant cough, yeah. uh, can we, for, a, for a developing country like ours, can we say that we have to follow the cocktail wherein we give hydroxychloroquine, we give a prophylactic antibiotic, we give low molecular weight heparin, all, all in one go, especially uh, if they need oxygen. Uh, for, for the hydroxychloroquine, we are not giving to, to, to children that refer to the, to, to the adult. Up to, so far, we, uh, we had only um, uh, that four patients. Uh, hydroxychloroquine it is not, uh, uh, we don't know about the safety in, uh, in uh, so they are covered with antibiotics, we don't give hydroxychloroquine, we, do, we, do, we give uh, oxygen and so on, but I have to say that uh, the, the lung presentation responds very well, so we didn't have any bad lung presentation, so uh, we were more worried about uh, the, the heart involvement. Uh, so that uh, what I show you about the oxytocin is more related to growing up, so adolescent and uh, to, to um, adult that uh, more likely have uh, can have uh, uh, a poor presentation in terms of uh, lung disease. So according to our preliminary experience, so a small number, but this is some, in some way confirmed by the Spain, the data from Spain, severe presentation is more related to, to the heart, so um, cardiogenic shock, uh, bad myocarditis, and so on. So the lung is not uh, probably that, that much the focus at the moment. So you just cover with antibiotic and the oxygen and so on, and the, the outcome was, was fine. So, Paolo, I am sharing your email ID here in the chat box. So, I request to whoever has got the questions directly, you can contact Paolo. Is it okay for you, Paolo? Yes, it's perfect. Would you like to answer them? Delighted to do. Yeah, I think uh, we are close to end this session. And the next speaker is uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar. I don't need to introduce him. And uh, he is mentor to a lot of people in this country and internationally. And I requested Dr. Mazni Elvi to moderate and panel this session uh, because Mazni Elvi is pioneer in duct stenting in the world. Whenever you search for PDA stenting, you will get some series of papers only by Dr. Mazni Elvi. During my postgraduate, I used to admire him from then onwards. So I'm very close follower of Mazni Elvi, and uh, thank you, Mazni Elvi, for coming here and then. 
sharing, going to share your experiences along with the, uh, KK today. Paolo, thank you very much. If you have time, you please stay back. Otherwise, you can uh, uh, go for your work because your presence might be needed there. Thank you. KK, are you ready, KK? Yes, I am ready. Uh, uh, thank yes. you so much. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me on board. And I'm really very pleased to listen to your talk. And we have a discussion after this, after your talk, to see how people are doing things with regards to PDA stamping. Yes, please carry on. Thank you. Uh, I have to again thank Nageshwar for putting, uh, thinking of this whole uh, session. Uh, and now we have the blessings of our society, the Pediatric Cardiac Society of India under which uh, this webinar continues. Uh, so we have a remarkable attendance of nearly 380 plus global audience, which uh, has made this whole webinar a remarkable event. Uh, it's, a, it's my pleasure, honor, and with some trepidation that I'm presenting PDA stenting in presence of uh, Mazni, who is the oh, pioneer. <laughs> uh, but that's OK. I will, uh, uh, it's an honor, for sure. Uh, I have to be, I've shown this slide before. I have some disclosures. One is that even after having done about 150, maybe nearly 200 such procedures, I cannot say I've mastered the procedure. I still consider this as the most challenging of all catheter interventions. And I have experienced all the complications that I have listed in this presentation. A historical perspective, I got the slide from Tom Carl. We did a debate together. Uh, but it's a beautiful slide that shows uh, what we are trying to do is has is trying to uh, not exactly replace, but uh, well, to some extent replace one of the most time-honored procedures that we've uh, grown up with as pediatric cardiologists. Uh, this uh, was a, a racially in and a gender integrated team, but uh, in all fairness, Dr. Vivian Thomas was not acknowledged adequately. It should have been the BPT chant but it was not that way. What we have is the BT shunt. Uh, and over the years, uh, our procedure, uh, PDA stenting has, has been sort of received very positively by the surgical uh, fraternity, unlike many other interventions where there has been a certain level of angst created by our desire to provide a surgical alternative. In this particular case, our surgical colleagues have been quite happy to have us do the newborns because the mortality with neonatal central shunt by and large across institutions, across databases has been quite unacceptable. And it is with this hope that we can improve upon the mortality that we've been doing a larger and larger number of PDS entities. But it didn't have a great story to start with. In 1992, John Gibbs, who is Sangeeta's boss, who was Sangeeta's boss, uh, showed that it can be done. The stents were primitive at that time. The hardware was difficult, but they still managed to stent uh, a couple of patients um, who didn't do well uh, in terms of survival, but the procedure was successful. In the next 12 years, there was no increase in enthusiasm at all. In fact, John Gibbs almost wrote an obituary for this procedure and said, it's not a good idea and it's unlikely to have a significant role in clinical practice. One paper slipped through. It was a paper that showed that it can be done with good results by uh, none other than Gerd Hofsdorf's team. And they showed in this paper in European Heart Journal a fairly good initial result. But the real transformation happened uh, uh, after some improvement in hardware uh, came in. The coronary balloons got better. We had better wires, better balloons, better stents. But then, it took somebody with the courage and conviction to actually change this significantly. And that was none other than Mals. Mazni, who did this in a substantial number with great outcomes and showed it can be done. The mean fluoroscopic time was very impressive, 29 minutes, considering the fact that these were early days. They had superb uh, in-hospital survival that matches current data uh, and uh, overall, this changed the paradigm completely. And since then, there has been a steady growth in this procedure and much wider acceptance. But still, it continues to be difficult. And I describe this procedure essentially as a series of judgment calls. One, there are several calls before the procedure. First, 
decision is is pds tenting the best option uh, i mean are, are you comfortable so it to some extent depends on the operator but it also depends a lot on the morphology of the duct so you have to be sure at the time you do the echo by uh, while doing the echo that you know and you understand the anatomy of the duct you understand the twists and turns to some extent although not always possible by echo you get an idea of the length you don't actually get to measure the true length but you get an idea and then after that you take a decision whether you need to stent or send the patient over to shunt and again this is to some extent colored by the experience of the operator uh, so at your early stages you may have a lower threshold to send to bt shunt but as you gain experience you can do more and more difficult cases the other element that is very important is presence of bifurcation stenosis and identifying the lpa on the echo uh, can be quite challenging at times so here's just an example of an echo that you know cuts this duct in various locations and while moving the probe up and down and side to side you get a sense as to how the duct courses along but then you can't actually recreate that in a picture as effectively as you can perhaps with the ct so increasingly there is a tendency to use the ct scan to come up with procedural planning so this is an important paper although had a very limited number of patients this paper just came out in december cat cvi and was reviewed in drop passes uh, podcast i think something uh, quite recent podcast one of the podcasts in the last four or five weeks talked about this paper quite nicely and had an interview with the author dr chamberlain what ct can do with 3d reconstruction is give you this perspective of all the three dimensions which is often lost in an echo or in an angiogram and we've done away without it but this particular study showed that you can have so many twists and turns that you probably need to understand up front and once you have a ct you're better off in deciding whether the patient is a candidate and then planning the procedure and i think we would switch increasingly to getting a ct uh, in patients where the duct doesn't appear straight forward on echo in our uh, we have a total experience of approximately 180 patients but i decided to put uh, the last uh, maybe 60 odd patients into a prospective database in our center where every small detail is recorded so in our experience in the last 54 consecutive cases that presented with pulmonary atresia of some form or the other we took up 52 and we in two abandoned after and we tend to now take up almost every single patient but i know that there are patients who can't be done and the two patients we abandoned were the ones with extreme tortuosity a 360 degree turn and there was one patient where there was a complete occlusion early in the neonatal period that we could not cross we have smaller babies as babies are smaller in india and uh, in this particular series our lowest weight was 1.7 but we've done a 1.5 kg baby as well earlier so this has been the story about feasibility so as you gain experience i suspect a, a larger proportion of patients end up uh, becoming candidates for pda stenting but as you increase your degree of difficulty your complications will be more that's to be expected because this is a unforgiving procedure if you make some serious mistakes and the the price you pay is sometimes with the life of the patient the other pre procedural judgment calls uh, which i think is very interesting in our own setup is that if you have a day old newborn let's say a baby is born after a prenatal diagnosis when do you do this procedure do you do it on day 1 day 2 day 3 day 4 uh, we are not so sure we tend to wait a little bit uh, and, and the reason we wait is that if you are trying to do this procedure very early the duct is extremely responsive to prostaglandin so even a small dose of prostaglandin tends to open up the duct fully and then it becomes really difficult to manage that process so i tend to wait at least for 48 to 72 hours before we attempt ductal stenting of course there are exceptions to do this the other issue is the patient comes from elsewhere it's very important to rule out neonatal sepsis particularly in our environment get a crp get a blood culture if necessary make sure those results are negative and then go ahead and implant because uh, uh, sepsis that is brewing in a newborn if you try and do a pda stent it can be a disaster so we tend to delay the other thing is if the baby is really really small 1.5 kilos 1.4 kilos 
then it's probably reasonable to delay closure, have the baby grow on prostaglandin to the extent that is possible, and then try and do a PDA stenting. It, it works. It's worked in many of our cases, and we have followed this policy. Our threshold is very hard to define, but by and large, tends to be hovering around two kilos. Uh, we've been forced to stent a few babies much smaller because the duct closed and we couldn't keep it open with prostaglandin. When do we stop PGE1 prior to the procedure? That's a very tough judgment call at times. Uh, we've got two categories of patients. The one where the duct is very responsive to prostaglandin. You start prosta and the SATs go up straight into the 90s. These are the subsets where you need to stop prostaglandin much later, very close to your procedure, but you can have difficulties because the duct has a mind of its own. We've had situations where we've taken patients to the cath lab, the duct never closed, and we've had to postpone the procedure by a day. We've had situations where we've tried to give indomethacin on table to get the duct to constrict. I don't like that idea. I think there is a potential harm from giving a drug like that, although it's just a single dose. Uh, I'm not in favor as far as possible, we should avoid that situation. So this category is difficult. The easier category is when your duct is already constricted on prostaglandin, patient is maintaining 80% saturation, typically older baby, you can even take up the patient on prosta. You're on a low dose prosta, the duct is clearly constricted on echo, you don't need to stop the prosta, keep the prosta at a very low level and just do it. I, uh, as a routine in our institution, every baby is intubated and we don't do this under conscious sedation, but I'm aware uh, of uh, Bhavik, my student who's done 70 ducts under conscious sedation with very good results because for some reason in his institution, they are afraid to do uh, conscious sedation uh, because they don't want to prolong intensive care. I think it's probably much safer to have the airway under control when you have so many reasons for the baby to stop breathing during your procedure. The most important judgment call as far as I am concerned about the procedure itself is your access. And access, what determines access? It's determined to a large extent by the fact that you want the straightest trajectory to the PDA. And that is determined by which side the arch is, how does the uh, duct come off the aorta? What's the angle of takeoff and what's the course? This determines where you would access, where you would puncture the child's, uh, the groin or the axilla. And the weight of the child, it's interesting. I find the axillary artery is far more forgiving than the femoral artery. So you can get by in a preterm, like let's say 1.5 kilo baby, you can put a four French sheath into the axillary artery, but it might be tricky to do it in the femoral artery. So I find uh, a very small body weight, I move towards the axillary artery as far as possible, and that's an important consideration. So here are some examples. Here is a duct that's coming off the uh, innominate, and in this particular case, you could either go via the femoral artery or via the axillary artery, as is in this particular case, we've gone via the axillary artery but you can go also via the femoral artery because you can imagine how you can get into this duct and have a stable catheter course either way. Here's an example of a right aortic arch with a vertical duct, which is profiled in the second frame that you can see out here. And in this particular duct, you can see uh, that this particular case, we have gone in through the right subclavian artery, which is right close to the origin of the duct closest to the origin of the duct, and that allows us to have a straight pathway into the duct. Uh, the other consideration I forgot to add during the site of access, right versus left axilla, is also the handedness of the person. A right-handed person prefers the right axilla. The left-handed person can work more closely with the left axilla. So in that situation, you can uh, choose either side. There's also this potential of turning the patient and flipping the patient and doing the left axilla from the light side, but I haven't done that. Uh, here's a vertical duct, which is having uh, a duct which is horizontal first and then vertical as it meets the aorta. And this particular case, it's a good idea to then use the left subclavian, which is right above the left axillary, which is right above the uh, vertical duct. You could also potentially use the right axillary artery in this particular case. Here's a tortuous duct with multiple twists and turns, but the origin of the duct 
is in line with the innominate artery. So in this particular case, the right axillary artery offers you the best opportunity to get into and stent this duct because you try to do it via the femoral, it could be much more challenging. Uh, another vertical duct, which is right below the uh, uh, left subclavian artery. So it's ideally suited to go via the left axillary artery. So here are all these examples that I have just summarized. Uh, vertical duct that is in line with the left subclavian, you could use the left axillary, which is in line with the right axillary, which is taking off at an angle that is convenient for the right axillary. You can use the right axillary. Um, for ducts that are relatively horizontal, but which have a small vertical component, you can use the cut pigtail. And that's the trick that Mazzini taught all of us. Uh, that works very well in these circumstances. The innominate artery, if the duct is having this angle, actually the femoral artery would be better because it's more in line with the origin of the duct. But if it is more vertical, you can go from the left axillary duct. And then the duct in pulmonary atresia and tac septum, it's always wise to go via the femoral artery using the Jackian's right catheter. The axillary artery is pretty useless for these patients. So understanding the duct anatomy beforehand is critical in deciding where you're going to puncture, which axis you're going to take. You must have complete clarity when you go into these tiny babies. They don't offer you too many chances. You can't go there on the and, and then say, okay, we'll figure out in the lab. Doesn't work most of the times. Hardware planning uh, in babies who are more than 2.5 kilos, I use the right axillary artery. I use a five French axis and a five French Jackins, right? And now I found that, and this is something that Bhavik told me that if you use a thermo sheath, there's really very little difference between the five French and the four French because it, it goes in rather smoothly into the uh, artery. But under two, 2.5 kilos, I think the five French struggles. Left axillary artery, you could just get by with a four French short sheath. You don't even need a guiding catheter because that sheath is very close to the mouth of the duct. You can inject from the side arm. You can get guided by that. You can pass the assembly directly via the short sheath without a catheter or a guiding catheter. Femoral five French sheath. Uh, take a cut pit tail first to hook the duct. But once you've got the wire, everything in, then you can take a GR4 guiding catheter and do the rest of the procedure using the guiding catheter. Sometimes you could use the long four French cook sheath, but I think the guiding catheter five French is, is probably better because the long four French cook sheath probably does more damage to the artery down below. The coronary wires, I have switched to the whisper extra support for almost everybody, but you know I think this is individual preference. I find this better than the BMW wire. It finds its way across the duct and offers a little more support to the uh, stent assembly. The pure whisper is superb when you're having a lot of difficulty in getting through. Uh, so you can put in a pure whisper first. And once you've got this in, you can take in a more stiffer wire and straighten out the duct and do the procedure with a body wire and take out the body wire just prior to the stent. There's something called the V14 wire, which the interventional radiologists use. And it is a very stiff wire. And it's terrific for tortuous ducts. So if you have an extreme tortuous duct that's got lots of twists and turns, you could put in a V14 wire, it straightens the whole duct out. And then you can deploy your stent and it by and large works. Of course, you can have one or two challenges and one challenge I'll share with you subsequently uh, as very good wire for these situations. I use a 3.5 millimeter bare metal stent of appropriate length for all patients about 2.5 kilos. I do not uh, use drug eluting stent in newborns because I'm uncertain about their safety. But I have been challenged recently on the availability of bare metal stents. And I am worried about the fact that we may have a situation where we don't have bare metal stents of all lengths available for ductal stenting. I have tried to speak to companies that make these stents to keep a stock of bare metal stents available in selected sizes, three millimeters diameter, 3.5 and four millimeters diameter, various lengths, just for the purpose of ductal stenting. Because I am concerned about the use of drug eluting stent, the amount of material, uh, uh, toxic drug that's available inside the stent may be quite significant for the size of a newborn baby, let's say two kilo baby. You could do some damage and that has not been tested, validated. So we have to be careful.
hardware for less than two kilos. Here's an example of a child who was 1.5 kilos when we stented. So less than two kilos, we can't go to a five French sheath. I tend to use a four French sheath, a three mm stent, and I don't use a guiding catheter. I take in bare the stent and use landmarks that I have previously identified uh, on the fluoroscopic screen and we mark those landmarks and try and deploy the stent or we use the left axillary artery that is then allows you to inject while you're putting in the stent. So this category is very, very challenging, uh, but feasible under selected circumstances. So obtaining access is a picture from Dittmar Schrantz's paper on the axillary artery axis. And I'll go spend a little time on this because not everybody is familiar with the axillary artery. Uh, we started, we were encouraged to try and use this axis after I read Dr. Dietmar Schrantz's paper. Um, and we use now ultrasound guided access from the axillary artery all the time. Uh, it really makes it uh, very, very expeditious safe, predictable. Our anesthetists, Dr. Jessen, uh, Dr. Sri Lakshmi, and earlier Dr. Amitabh used to be doing this, and they've become really good at it. Uh, we are learning it, and some of us can actually now do it, but uh, the kind of experience the anesthetists have with the ultrasound guided access makes them much better experts. We have a very specific sequence. We punct always puncture with the 24 gauge cannula. We as soon as we puncture, we put in a PTCA wire, a short PTCA wire, which we've cut, 014 wire, and we've got the wire inside. Then we advance the cannula till it goes all the way till the level of the skin. We take out this wire and replace it with the 018 wire, which is available in the cook sheath. Um, and that wire gives it a little more support. We then take the 20 gauge cannula over this wire and through that 20 gauge cannula, we pass the termo wire and then we put the termo sheet. Now this sequence allows us to minimally damage the artery. And the wire, the final step, which is the termo sheath wire combination, nothing matches the termo sheath in terms of its fitness, snugness over the wire and the smoothness and the lack of injury uh, that we have. So we are, don't even have to give an incision in the skin, it just goes through. Uh, the direct puncture we can use, uh, uh, but uh, we do that only if the anesthetist is not available or the ultrasound machine is not available. That strangely happens in our center sometimes. Um, the other technique is, of course, to use the wire-guided puncture. So you have to puncture at another site, like the femoral artery or the femoral vein, and get your PTCA wire to sit inside this axillary artery and then use that wire as guidance under fluoroscopy to then puncture. It also works very well, but I have to say the ultrasound is the best. This is a picture of, uh, from Dietmar Schanz's paper, but shows you the positioning, really extension of the hand, of the elbow, uh, and making sure that you can feel the head of the humerus uh, and the femoral uh, axillary artery on top of the head of the humerus. It tends to be slippery out there, so you can stretch the skin a little bit and then puncture. Uh, and then, of course, Dietmar Schanz does it this way. He punctures directly, gets the blood out, puts the wire, and then moves in uh, in this fashion. And then once you take out the sheath, you just have to directly compress. Amazingly, the pulse returns predictably within 30 to 40 minutes almost every single time. Complications, the risk of stroke is real. Unlike the femoral artery, when you flush in the axillary artery, what you flush goes straight to the brain. So the proximity to the brain arteries makes it very, very dangerous. So you have to aspirate and make sure there is no air or microthrombi far more meticulously than you would do with the femoral artery. There's a risk of hematoma if you're careless uh, after compression because the compressing site may slip. It's a rounded head of the um, femur, humerus. Occlusion is uncommon, especially if you uh, use ultrasound guidance and, and the way you do it, if I suggest it to you. And then one complication we have encountered because we've done so many axillary arteries and I think if you do enough numbers, you'll encounter this complication is a pseudoaneurysm two babies, we've had pseudoaneurysms, we've had to manage them through direct thrombin instruction, injection via with ultrasound guidance. And uh, we did that, we reported this paper, and this is what we had in, in both these patients, uh, a large pseudoaneurysm between the axillary artery and the adjacent vein. And this fortunately can be managed with ultrasound guided thrombin injection, just like you do with any other adult 
uh, case, but this is something that you have to be watchful about. And it happens a few weeks to a month after the uh, puncture. Another judgment call relates to the angiographic views. Uh, and which view do you use? And you could waste a lot of contrast if you don't understand this. So PA IVS with horizontal ducts with an MPA lateral view is the best because it shows the duct and MPA in the same view, it works very well. Uh, with vertical and tortuous ducts variable, there are several challenges, which is relating to the shape, how you can profile the entire shape to the extent you can profile, uh, overlap with adjacent structures, very difficult at times. So you have to try not to use too much of contrast to figure this out prior to actually wiring the duct. So what I tend to do is that I take one injection with the uh, if I put in an axillary artery sheath, just one injection with the side arm to get an idea. And then after that, I don't try to make many injections until I've wired the duct. Often your wire goes through and by moving your fluoroscopic screen, you get a sense as to what view profiles the wire and its entire length uh, along the duct. And that view usually is a good view to define the duct. Uh, so in this case, the first injection I've made out here with the right axillary artery, fortunately here yeah. in the, in the LAO view, you're able to profile the duct. You stop because I'm chairing a, chairing a conference like a India. My conference. Uh -huh. yeah. you, you start, so I did start. I told, I go. So here's an example of overlap where it's a right aortic arch and you can see that the duct is just not profiled. So moving to an LAO position, in this particular case has enabled you to see the duct much better with under surface, et cetera. So this, again, I would say that when you spend time with the echo, you get a better sense as to which view should you choose uh, when you do this uh, angiography. The other big challenge I found is to identify the PA end correctly. So here is an example where it's very clearly seen, the PA end, and it's partly aided by the fact that you're injecting directly inside the duct with the guiding catheter, and that's what you should endeavor for to identify the PA end. Uh, but sometimes you can find it very difficult, even despite everything, because there's so many structures overlapping. Uh, if there is an MPA stump, it is not important to find the PA end precisely, because you can take advantage of the fact that your wire is sitting in the MPA, and you can actually deploy your stent uh, good distance inside the MPA. As you can see in this example, where I have made the wire, a very stiff wire, sit inside the MPA, and that allows you to put your stent well into the MPA beyond the PA and without being worried about jailing any of the structure. So whenever you have an MPA, I have taught this to everybody who's worked with me, it's as far as possible, try and make a wire loop within the MPA and take advantage of this because then you can put your stent well into the PA end. Here's another example where you have uh, uh, a real difficulty in identifying the PA end. I th there are situations where despite everything, you can have challenge in identifying the PA end. And so that's something that you have to uh, contend with at times. And sometimes despite everything, you take a guess and you deploy a little err on the side of putting it inside the PA and you end up jailing one of the vessels. And this happens to all of us. And I, I think we haven't totally figured this out in every single case, but I've given you all the tricks that I had with me. The aortic end is much easier. Uh, in the lateral view, the NG tube is a very good landmark and you can always target the nasogastric tube as the approximate site where you would have the aortic end end. And, and some protrusion into the aorta is okay. You don't have to worry. It's not of major consequence as the child grows. The echo is, of course, very helpful. The stent length is best determined after, again, a very tricky thing. It's best determined after the duct is wired. You shouldn't try to measure the stent length before that. Okay. So here is the exact desired size of your stent may not be available. Your wire in the MPA, you can always put, measure it from the aortic end to well beyond the PA end. The duct configuration may be altogether different after deployment, so you can be uh, fooled sometimes. And, and these are things that make you have to be prepared for putting in another stent to make sure that you cover both the ends. So here is an example that I showed you just now, the MPA 
the fact that you have an MPA stump allows you then to really go beyond the PA end. The few other issues that relate to anticoagulation platelet in inhibition. Uh, one thing is the INRs in newborns tend to be elevated. My preference is to get this clo as close to normal as possible before I take up the patient. I accept INRs around 1.5. Uh, we use vitamin K, rarely do we give FFP, but we try to get it close to normal and then we attempt stenting. Uh, aspirin uh, is my, my preferred drug following the duct uh, stenting, but for the first 48 hours, we always, uh, 24 hours, we use heparin infusion. I think it's very important to measure your ACT after your first heparin in, uh, administration on table. Uh, you have to absolutely make, it, make sure that your heparin has acted. Otherwise, you could have a situation of instant thrombosis, and I've had two instances, uh, both resulting from the fact that I neglected to pay attention to the ACT right after I gave the heparin dose, assuming that the heparin was adequate. So I'll just list the judgment calls, just to summarize what you have said so far. Is it feasible? Which access? When to stop prostaglandin? Which angiographic view? Where is the aortic end? Where is the PA end? What is the shape of the duct? Which catheter, which wire, is again, sort of based on preference. How will the anatomy change after it's wired, after it's stented? And amazingly, the anatomy can change substantially after it's stented as well. What is the stent diameter? What is the stent length? Has it been deployed correctly? Have both ends been captured? Is there a need for an additional stent? Are the branch PAs okay? So all these judgment calls are of critical importance. And it's experience that teaches you how to address all these issues very well. Uh, even the fact that when you want to remove the wire, when is it safe to remove the wire? Because some instances you've had of stent thrombus happening right after the wire. So we generally tend to wait a little bit, uh, about five minutes uh, after which we remove the wire. The specific challenges are tortuous ducts, complete occlusion or near total occlusion that can happen uh, of the duct. So we, I mean, this is before you uh, you have a nearly occluded duct and it can be challenging. Branch PA stenosis, very tiny babies, and there are many more, I'm sure. But these are the ones that bother me the most. Here's one example of the tortuous duct that I showed you, where there are several twists and turns in three dimensions. And you can see that this particular duct, uh, we went from the right uh, axillary approach, uh, and we straightened it to some extent by putting in the wire and then we managed to get the stent, but we couldn't get it from end to end. And so we had to put a second stent at the PA. And I can tell you that it's, this is quite dangerous what I did. Uh, it's important to get the stent of the right length. In this particular case, we didn't have that length on table. And we've landed into this problem uh, because we've been trying to put this bare metal stent of the appropriate length. So this can be a challenge. But in this particular case, the first stent straightened out a part of the duct and we were able to then put the second stent through it. And of course, the final shape of the duct, you can see, has nothing to do with the shape that the duct had before the stent was put. All the tortuosities, tortuosities have got straightened out. Here's another example of bifurcation stenosis that I had shown in the Asian conference, where we thought we were very clever in doing the stent into the LPA and, and uh, uh, dilating the struts via the side arm, uh, by the side struts. And we were able to get a very good immediate result. But then the side struts, uh, eventually the right pulmonary artery became severely constricted and we had to go in and surgically reconstruct the entire pulmonary artery. And this was because the damage done to the side struts result in, results in endothelial proliferation from the fractured stents. So it's very important not to do this, but this is a big challenge that you face sometimes. Here's an occluded duct, fully occluded duct, where you can't see any kind of flow that's happening, but we were encouraged to try and do this because of the fact that we had uh, a very young baby in this particular instance, and we used the uh, total occlusion wires. In this case, it was a Felder FC wire that allowed us to cross the uh, freshly occluded stent, and we were able to get a decent wire position, as you can see out there, and then, of course, we were able to uh, stent this particular child's duct, and we had a good result. In this case, the hardware is interesting. We used a cooked forefront sheath with a cutoff pigtail, and this, this acted like an end hole catheter because the side holes of the cutoff pigtail are covered by the sheath, and this enabled us to use this particular combination of hardware and do it. 
Other acute complications, the failure to negotiate a PD. I've had a situation where the duct has gone into spasm and refused to uh, uh, respond to anything else and then becomes very big challenge to get through. Dissection, you'll be surprised the ease with which the ductal tissue dissects. So unless you get a really free flow of blood in your guiding catheter, do not inject. And even sometimes after getting a free flow, if you inject forcefully, you can dissect the PDA. And if you dissect, you can't see the anatomic details. It's a disaster. Stent occlusion, two instances, falling short of the either end. It has happened with me and I've had to put stents to cover both the ends. Acute stenosis of branch PAs can happen and stent displacement. All this can happen. And these are all challenges. I'll just quickly show them one by one. Here's an example of a stent that was vertical. And we thought we were very clever in putting in a V14 wire, straightening it out and putting in a stent. We put the stent and we had terrific initial result. But when we took out the really stiff wire, look what happens. I'll wait till this whole video plays itself. The stiff wire comes out. Look what happens to the stent. So this stent underwent a 360 degree rotation after the wire was removed and slipped out of the PA end. So the wire that the stent that was going, covering the PA end now completely came out. And in this tortuous duct, we had the stent sitting. So I had to go in and remove the stent with a snare from the axillary artery and re-stent the duct. And it was much easier from the axillary artery uh, in this particular case. So very important to remember that. While you remove this balloon, from the axillary artery, you can sometimes displace the stent and you have to be mindful about that. This is my worst case uh, of a stent that I had deployed, which had acute trauma, uh, occlusion right after I uh, uh, took it out. And that resulted in a, a real disaster. And we had to do CPR, take out the stent with a snare, and then take the patient to emergency surgery. And the child has had uh, some brain insult as a result of this. So this can be very dangerous. Immediately after the procedure, you can have a transient desaturation from the fact that you have unknowingly uh, lost some blood on table. So the hemoglobin can drop to very low levels and you can have an unexplained desaturation. So you have to be watchful about that. Your blood gases are important. Anesthetist is really important in managing the process. Important to have mechanical ventilation. Important to know which line and access you should leave behind as the patient goes out of the lab. Heparin 24 hours. I often use milrinone in very small babies with large PDA uh, that we have to manage to make sure that we don't overcirculate and infection prevention is critical. Intermediate complications, sepsis, particularly in our setting, necrotizing enterocolitis for the very small babies, access site issues in hematoma, etc. Very, very important to monitor for all that. Follow up, very, very critical. Amazingly, uh, it is done. All our patients have done well. We've not had any late occlusions, uh, but it can happen. Uh, we've had stenosis, and we've been able to manage that. Branch PA stenosis can happen, and you have to watch out for that as well. So to conclude, this is a procedure of numerous challenges, and it requires meticulous planning, but clear-headed execution. Once you've made your plan, you should have a very clear uh, execution in the table because you can't dither, you can't sort of go between ideas and, and then you get into trouble. And then of course the team, the entire team is very important. In fact, in this particular case, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Balaganesh who's helped me collect all these slides uh, and from our compiler, we couldn't do it because of the lockdown, we couldn't go back to our cath lab easily, uh, but we, he did it from his archives. My other colleagues who've helped me in this procedure, uh, particularly my adult colleagues, who taught me how to use the coronary hardware in the beginning. My extraordinary anesthesiology colleagues who I think managed, helped manage all my babies and my surgical colleagues who backed me and bailed me out on a couple of situations. Thank you. Thank you, KK. Very, very excellent coverage of this procedure. And I totally agree with you that for me, even now, this is the most challenging procedures in the cath lab that we, that we do. And every time I get this kind of cases, I get very nervous. I have one or two consultants with me. And also we discuss almost all the cases with the surgeons before we go in. But there are a lot of questions here. It's, it's, I'm sure this kind of topic will generate questions. But I'll just quickly go through what you have mentioned uh, before going to the question that you covered about uh, 
not so much education, but how complex uh, PDAs can be, and therein the importance of CT scan pre-procedure, which helps us to pre-select which we think is likely to be uh, a more successful or more amenable to stenting. So that is very important. I think I totally agree with that. And then a very important area, which I think has changed a lot in terms of uh, people's courage to do it and also the success rate is access. And you mentioned about electronic access, which I think Rick Marsh runs first uh, published that and we all love that paper and how important that is to our work. And again, I like you, for me, most cases, except the IBS that we will approach uh, stenting by auxiliary access. There are a couple of questions here that, uh, uh, again, I also uh, query that you did not mention at all. And there are two questions people ask about carotid artery access. Uh, what is your view on this, Keke? I have no experience. Uh, the, uh, the others are welcome to chip in, I guess, uh, uh, Paolo and Avinash. Yeah? Yeah, you, you, you don't think that ever for no, I, yourself? You... I haven't done it. And I know it's uh, very popular in many, mm. many centers. And there are people who are very familiar and comfortable doing it. Mm. Uh, my comfort level has been with the axillary axis. So uh, we've learned it. And we've never had to resort to the carotid because of that. But I'm sure it's a reasonably good option. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a fairly good experience of uh, carotid. Uh, we started this procedure in uh, 2012 uh, uh, actually. And then we embarked on that. We continued for four years. Open carotid access, surgeon actually opens the uh, left carotid, not the right carotid in the left arch situation. Unless you have right arch with the undersurface of the duct. So it is a very good procedure. Uh, you can predictably do it. The only problem is when you put the sheet, there is a problem of it can potentially damage the ductus at aortic end. That is one point we noticed. Second is we had two cases of carotid dissection open, but they, they were asymptomatic. Then last before 2018 there is a paper from circulation that percutaneous carotid is a reasonably good option so we did on four cases of percutaneous carotid axis uh, finds reasonable but i embarked on to left axillary now right axillary most of the 99 percent of the cases goes on right axillary unless it's a pa ibs where predictably we can enter from the femoral uh, vein femoral artery approach uh, okay, uh, while talking about excess, uh, KK, uh, I also love the auxiliary approach. But do you do it under fluoro? Because I, when I pass the wire, when I pass the wire, the coronary wire, I always do it under fluoroscopy because very often it goes up to the vertebral artery. Yes. So if you do, you don't do it under that you might you might be pushing too hard and that might cause problem. Absolutely. So once you've got the ultrasound access, the wire movements are all fluoroscopically correct yeah. uh, seen. And the other thing is that maybe if, for example, you have a left arch and you go from the right uh, auxiliary, is to look uh, if there is any apparent right subclavian because that, that yes. might cause problem. <laughs> yeah, so just make Absolutely. sure you do that. So that's something we figured out by echo beforehand. Yeah, that's right. Uh, another question which is uh, uh, repeated two or three times here is uh, you have shown two cases where you retrieved a stent, one was thrombosed and the other one was, uh, it twisted so much that uh, you'd have to, you have to remove it. So I, there, there's a question with regarding how do you remove an embolized stent or you, when you need to remove stent? So actually the coronary stents are uh, very uh, compressible and they can be crushed into, uh, they can be caught via the snare and they come out quite easily uh, from a five French uh, sheath. So surprising, I, this is something I discovered just because I was so desperate on that particular day. Uh, I've had actually three instances where I've had to remove stents and re-stent. Um, and it's worked uh, all the time, all the three times. Uh, it can be done. It's, uh, you have to uh, put your snare around the entire stent and it crushes the stent and usually it bends and folds and comes out through the five French sheet. It's can we ask the uh, opinion of Dr. C. N. Mandanadan? He logged in. Can you please... Uh, Give audio and video of Dr. C. N. Manjura. Sir, uh, can you hear me, sir? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can yes, hear you. Well. Sir. Nice very to well. know that you logged in. Now, yes. just a completed talk of Dr. Krishna Kumar uh, yeah. on PDS tenting in a neonate. Yeah. Neonates, and we have a panelist and moderator, Dr. Majni Alvi from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, pioneer in this particular area. Now we have a question that adults, how they use this hardware, and if there is the embolization of the coronary stent, can we crush it and then take out? Is the question. Since I saw you, then it is an appropriate time to ask you your opinion and your comments on this. Yeah, particularly if the stent is uh, embolized. Uh, of course, uh, it's not like a coronary status. It is not a, a life-threatening thing, first, first of all. Uh, that is one thing. And we can always use this, our coronary hardware, and we can always uh, pull it out, no problem. You can always use this uh, uh, coronary wires and twist them, and you can always uh, take it out. The question is, um, I wanted to know whether the stent after deployment, that's what you're telling, right? Yes, sir. So after yeah, deployment, yeah. Oh, yeah, after a deployment. stand that has migrated, <laughs> that's not the issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. No. Suppose if the stent is uh, migrated, then yes, we can always. Uh, if you are lucky, you can always pass a wire. You can pass a wire uh, through the stent. Uh, then you can um, take the balloon, inflate partially, and you can always take it out sometimes. So that is one. Or you can use this, some of these uh, usual angioplasty uh, technique of uh, passing a uh, couple of wires, then twisting it. Or if you sometimes, uh, if the stent is coaxial, you can always pass this uh, coronary uh, wire through the stent. Then you inflate the balloon uh, into the, uh, I mean, into the stent, and you can always uh, retrieve it back. That's how sometimes used to do. Or if it is not coming, then you have to crush it. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Madri, you can yeah. go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry for the interruption no, 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 no. in between. Sir, another issue that I also want to highlight, uh, as KK did, is the issue of acute thrombosis immediately after stent deployment. So I think this is another very important aspect in terms of uh, pro uh, complications post procedure. And I think KK, you showed very well that this is uh, an important critical issue that can lead to uh, major. Uh, deficits in, in this patient. So, and you rightly mentioned that I think one of the ways in which we can minimize this is to leave the wire maybe for 10 minutes, do the ACTs and make sure that the stent is, is patent before, before, you, before you come out. So that is something that's been highlighted as well among the questions here. Jay Gana, you, you have something to ask KK here? Jay? Oh, uh, uh, Jaragnath here. KK? Yeah. And Alvi, Dr. Alvi Mazina, Alvi also both. Increasingly, we are finding a problem of the branch pulmonary artery stenosis. If you stent into one of the artery, RP or LPA, if there is already a narrowing in the other artery. So, how are you dealing? Because we are seeing after three to four months later, I think we, uh, many times, this uh, stenosis gets more severe. And uh, how do you deal with that? So, uh, Jay, I tend to uh, have a low threshold for the next surgical step if we find that the branch PA stenosis is developing or progressing. So, we no, almost 30 to 40 percent of those, uh, I mean, all these cases will have some amount of stenosis, PK. Yes, we I cannot agree. Avoid that. We cannot I agree, avoid. but if it is significant and it's starting to interfere with perfusion of one lung, then oh. we usually use that to go, go towards surgery. Surgery. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, because uh, the next step typically is a RV to PA conduit and a VSD closure if it's tetralogy pulmonary atresia. And we have, our surgeons are willing to do that around four to six months of age. Uh, as uh, So, that is probably what we can achieve in these patients. They have a reasonable body weight of around five to six kilos, six kilos. At that yeah. time, we go ahead and operate. Uh, if it was a BT shunt, certainly we could have waited much longer in these patients. Yes, I'm yes, sure yeah, that yeah, yeah. the yeah. BT shunts much last much longer than our stents do. But um, mm -hmm. once you put in a stent, we've tended to 
move into surgery. To say that if there is already intrinsic stenosis of 80, 70 to 80 percent, uh, it's not advisable to stent, isn't it? I mean, PDA stent. Yes, it's not at all advisable. Because yeah, whatever we have done, couple of, I mean, when we have encountered here and we have gone through this strategy, we have opened that. But invariably during the follow-up, we find within two, three months that it's getting blocked. Right? That's not yes. a nice thing to have. Yes. Even for a surgeon, that becomes difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I definitely will have Mazni comment on it because he has a much wider experience than we uh, do. Yeah, Jaya, we can be very, very wary of this kind of anatomy before. But yeah. now we are a bit more confident of uh, stenting them because not all that have LPA stenosis will go on to develop very small LPA. And secondly, yeah. if they develop too early before surgery, for example, three or four months, we would go in and re-stent across that uh, okay. small LPA. With, but don't go too far into the LPA because the surgeon might have a problem in terms of removing it okay. on the post surgery. So yeah. I think this is the issue where sometimes you wonder whether there might be a role here for for stents that are bioresorbable so that you don't, the surgeons will not have a big problem in terms of removing a stent once uh, the stent resorbs. But I'm not very sure whether such stents uh, will be av available uh, in the near future. So right now, we rely on bare metal stents and we have quite a low threshold of re-stenting into that stenosed uh, branch. Okay, right okay. okay. Can I comment, uh, Baznik? I would like yeah. to tell my experience. We have done uh, 18 cases of this. We know that there is a branch PS stenosis. Our policy is uh, to put the stent, even if there is a branch PS stenosis, deploy the stent and we do the angiogram and see the, the branch PS stenosis how much of significant. It will be most of the, except one case, all cases it was significant. Yeah. Leave the wire there, take another wire, and then we cross the struts of the ipsilateral stenosis. Then we take a small balloon, which is most of the time so 2.5 millimeter into short length of 10 millimeter. And we open the struts. Then we saw that the LPA flow, most of the times LPA, and we opened RPA side also. It improves very significantly. And 80% of our cases, they went for surgery. So, but all patients, all patients, they need plastic of the pulmonary artery, pulmonary PA plastic, they need it. But this is our approach and we came with the manuscript and uh, about to be submitted this week. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Yes. I, I like that approach as well, uh, and I guess. So I'm not as worried now as before because, yeah, either we can restand or as you say, you can uh, balloon it uh, at the first time when you stand it. And then th that small opening will help in terms of flow. To, into, into, the other, into that status branch PA. The another question is that uh, post-surgery, okay, you mentioned about, uh, I think uh, there's not a lot of debate with regards to what antiplatelets, but I think in terms of uh, tackling this kind of branch PA stenosis, so uh, your, the, what is your surgeon's experience after, after stenting the PDA? Do they have problems in terms of surgical repair or not? Does it really make repair more difficult? It does make repair more difficult, but our surgeons have got familiar and we've had very good results uh, overall in our stented cohort uh, in terms of the next stage surgery. I haven't compiled it fully, but all our patients have made it through to the next stage and we've been able to repair the PAs and uh, uh, you know, uh, do the RV to PA conduit in these patients. Uh, Follow-up is short. We need more time before we can be sure about what happens long-term. But we are able to tide over this. That's a question from Dr. Babar. He's asking if uh, the, the, the stent becomes inadequate uh, before the patient is big enough for surgery, would you go for re-stenting or would you go for a beauty shunt? So what, what is the panel's experience on this? Nagas, what do you think? Um, So, uh, if Nagesh, did you get the question? Uh -huh. I, can you please repeat it? The, later so the part? question is, uh, what happens when you have a restenosis? Do you stent again or do you do a BT shunt? I think if there is a restenosis, most of our cases, they go for complete correction. Because Let's say it happens very early and you're not able to do yeah, it. If, if it. If it happens very early in the next few weeks, we try to give anti-coagulants. Uh, heparin in the ICU and then we try to open if it is the soft thrombus. Otherwise, all our cases, they go for complete correction because our surgeon is very comfortable with the 
complete correction even in the neonatal but I'll, I'll give you a scenario we had a which happened with us we had a two uh, 1.5 kg baby we put a 3 mm stent because you can't put a larger stent this child was 3 kilos preterm child and was significantly restenosed at 3 kilos to put an rv to pa conduit is a bit of a challenge so in these circumstances what is your preference our shunt or or uh, our hospital we don't do bt shunt at all we do so we can put no shunt or complete correction because our surgeon doesn't want to do bt shunt. no we've done bt shunts in selected patients i think we've had three or four instances because once they are past the newborn period the risk of bt shunt is less so you can do a bt shunt in selected yeah. circumstances we've also gone ahead and restented a few ducts uh, which have restenosed uh, in these circumstances and it works yeah okay, okay. I, i mean I, you I, already put a 3 mm stent already most of the i think you are putting a bare metal stents i think even uh, we can avoid even stenting restenting also you can go up to 3.5 3.5 if you use i pressure yeah. balloon on a nc balloon you can go up slightly over 3.5 we have done couple of them in last six yes. months right. are you the reasonably good result you are absolutely right we can't push them maybe surgery but we can take yes. only one question okay uh, after that shiv kumar is ready to talk i am okay. uh, willing to postpone yes. my talk for tomorrow or uh, uh, other day Just this last question: How do you deal with uh, stent, acute stent thrombosis? Uh, do you? This is a question from. I'm not sure. This is from. Uh, but, okay. but anyway, there's a question with regards to stent thrombosis. How you, how do you deal with it? Do you use heparin or do you use uh, thrombolytic therapy or do you just balloon mechanically uh, uh, break off the break off the thrombus? It's a really bad uh, situation. I use a. We try to give high dose heparin. And we try to. Uh, suck out the clot we try to reballoon and nothing really works in the two instances i've had the only thing that worked was taking out the stent altogether mm-hmm. but uh, it's a disaster uh, masni i'll ask you because uh, this is something we need to know uh, right from my experience i then after i had my initial, initial ones i would leave the wire for maybe 10 15 minutes and if it, th- right. it occurs at the time i can you can reballoon and and break off the stent and then start heparin but i have also in the last maybe uh, two or three cases i've used uh, anti thrombolytic uh, thrombolytic therapy uh, with rtpa mm-hmm. so that that seems to work well i was very worried about hemorrhage in the brain but with rtpas i have not had right. that kind of complication so, yeah uh, hello uh, everyone okay. i'm dr pramit kaur hello dr prabhu k and dr uh, and everyone i have a question to dr k k sir so regarding the size of the stents you have uh, when you have described the length and the uh, these things in one of your previous classes you said that you have a uh, you have a protocol according to the width of the stent like 2.5 to 3 mm 3.5 mm this question i'm asking in view of the uh, post ductless stenting scenario where have you faced the scenario where there is an underflow or overflow kind of a situation and how do you manage it in the pic in the pic if you end up with a over circulation you have to keep the child uh, we end up keeping the child ventilated for a little bit uh, we track the lactates and perfusion urine output etc we give milrinone and uh, usually we are able to tide over with that keep the fio to very low that's the most important thing room air ventilation under ventilate keep pco2s in the 50s he give milrinone in 48 hours usually you can get by one more point i would like to add actually it is a, a good idea to actually reduce the svr and also it's a good idea to give the beta blockers in this situation we tend to give diuretics if you give diuretics usually it enhances the thrombosis i learned this from professor brightman shah where he actually couple of years back explained the mechanisms and all now we are giving beta blockers also it's working very well Okay, I think uh, uh, Siva Kumar has to give his next talk. Uh, and I guess it's been very exciting topic and discussions, and I'm sure uh, there are many more questions uh, which are coming in. But I think I'll try to answer them by WhatsApping to Life Tech guy there, and then he can probably forward it. To I I thank uh, Majni Alvi for taking time and moderating uh, the session and uh, sharing his uh, real life experiences on this particular subject. 
and also i thank the speaker uh, professor krishna kumar sir for his wonderful talk now may i request uh, uh, dr shiv kumar he doesn't need introduction because he is a faculty and continuously giving talks and he is going to give us the information and uh, trans catheter approach towards the coartation of aorta today i am not going to give my last talk i will let you know when we are going to have the tarvio test stenting thank you madhuni if you yes, have I, time i need to take back. a boost i have to a meeting on, yeah. on covid That's patients absolutely so, fine. Yeah. yes uh, yes thanks thank you lot uh, uh, can you please uh, uh, proceed with your talk yes i i, I thanks thanks i guess and siva and kk bye bye thank you masni and thank you paolo for uh, coming inside for uh, uh, a few hours uh, the topic today is coarctation of aorta which is uh, basically being sandwiched by two interventional talks one on stenting of the ductus and second was stenting of the rvot and this is more of how to evaluate and the principles of management coarctation is accounts for about 68% of congenital heart disease usually a periductal stenosis of the aorta but we need to understand that sometimes it can proximally extend into the isthmus or aortic arch and in some of the patients it can be very deep it can be thoracic aorta or abdominal aorta the natural history data shows that roughly 50% survive for around 30 years and 90% survive for up to Uh, the coarctation of aorta need not always be periductal that we need to understand these are examples of abdominal coarctation of aorta this is a long segment abdominal coarctation in a in a uh, child of around 8 years which was managed by an extra anatomical bypass why do patients with coarctation of aorta die when it gets into heart failure adult frequently dies of coexistent atherosclerotic disease rarely it can be dissection rupture hypertensive heart failure pulmonary edema which can be flash pulmonary edemas during pregnancy cerebrovascular accidents brain bleeding or sometimes during intervention and surgery the coarctation of aorta who is getting a dissection immediately after her intrauterine death of a pregnancy and you can appreciate an extensive dissection this dissection goes all the way even involving femoral arteries so what we need to understand is that coarctation of aorta is not just a discrete disease it's a diffuse aortopathy coarctation is broadly grouped into simple coarctation where there is nothing else pda can be present or bicuspid aortic valve present but no other major congenital heart disease complex coarctations commonly have ventricular septal defect which may be malaligned or any form of mitral aortic valve lesions or complex cyanotic heart disease why it occurs it may be due to flow dynamics it may be due to ductal tissues continuing to shrink it may be due to abnormal lymphatics or sometimes it may be purely an aortic dysplasia these are some of the examples of aortic dysplasia a coarctation with something like a screw of the transverse aortic arch we can appreciate that some of these will be very bizarre this will this will be explained by gross dysplasia of the aorta during its morphogenesis another example of gross dysplasia of the aorta the differentiation between an infantile coarctation and an adult coarctation is primarily due to collateralization it is the collateralization that explains why a baby has to present very very early if there is a failure of collateralization and why they escape infancy if there is an adequate collateralization it is the same collateralization that creates problems for the surgery that coarctation is coming increasingly on to the interventional table especially when the patients are grown up and so called adult coarctations wherein the extent of collateralization is too much that the surgeon cannot handle it's one of the most commonly missed clinical lesion in a fetal heart it may be an evolving entity you can have an absolutely normal fetal echocardiogram at 32 weeks but by the time the baby is born at 40 weeks that can be a coarctation when fetal echo primarily emphasizes on four chamber and outflow sometimes you may miss it a newborn it is a, it's a sepsis mimic infants with a respiratory distress syndrome without any cardiac murmur can be thought to be primarily respiratory 
child can present with unexplained dilated cardiomyopathy. Adult can receive polytherapy for systemic hypertension. Older patients get coronary artery surgery or coronary artery interventions or sometimes aortic valve replacements without the knowledge of underlying population. What we need to know about the anatomy is that left subclavian artery in some patient can be very, very close to the coarctation with a stenotic origin that left subclavian can be involved in the coarctation. Again, we have to note that about 4 to 5 percent of the patients can have an aberrant subclavian artery, which is quite of significance, especially if this aberrant subclavian is extremely close to the post coarctation region where the surgeon has to plan his surgery. Subclavian steel syndrome can occur. Berry aneurysms can occur in about 3 to 5 percent of the patients. Blood pressure assessment remains the key for diagnosis of coarctation, but we need to understand sometimes we will have a weak left arm pulses. It can be due to severe left subclavian artery narrowing. It can be a pre subclavian coarctation. This is an example of a pre subclavian coarctation where the subclavian is actually coming off beyond the, beyond the coarctation, or in other words, this is called as a distal transverse arch coarctation. And the third one will be post subclavian flap aortoplasty, where the surgeon resects it out and the surgeon removes the subclavian artery. It was a commonly performed surgery in the past because a healthy left subclavian wall was used to reconstruct the aorta with less chances of narrowing. The problems remained with arm ischemia, arm hypoplasia. 10% of the patients may not have a vertebral artery and these patients can really have arm ischemia. I would say subclavian artery is an artery of paradox. Surgeries for coarctations, Aortic arch aneurysms, aortic arch dissections do sacrifice subclavian artery. The cardiologist will contend, we have lost the arterial conduit for future bypass surgery. Not factually correct. In majority of these diseases, mammaries are diseased or mammaries are too large to act as a conduit. Similarly, interventions may sacrifice the subclavian artery. Interventions on isolations of subclavian artery Interventions like covered stent of coarctation, stent grafts for aneurysm may sacrifice the subclavian artery. Surgeons may contend here arm ischemia and length discrepancy, but we need to factor in the risk benefit ratio of protecting the subclavian versus sacrificing the subclavian. Cervical aortic arch is another problem wherein left subclavian stenosis are much more common. You can have gross pulsations in the root of the neck indicating that it's a cervical arch and we can have severe stenosis of the subclavian artery. We can have coarctations that have weak pulses in all the limbs. You can have a subclavian, you can have a coarctation that is somewhere in the middle of the thoracic arch with both the subclavians arising much after the coarctation. So we need to understand that pulse alone is not going to be the solution. Yeah, sort of meticulous clinical examination including examination of the keratin has to be done. Some of the characteristics of blood pressure examination is arm hypertension with very high pulse pressure, caused by mechanical obstruction, yeah, baroreceptor reset, renin, angiotensin, aldosterones. Over a period of time, secondary vascular changes which can be either atherosclerotic or arteriosclerotic, late onset calcifications, and a lot of Blood vessel compliance change can be by the treatment. Yeah, pericardial patch, yeah, Gore-Tex patch that has been used for repair or yeah, stent that has been used can all change the compliance. The lower limb pulse is of low pulse pressure. Just look at it carefully. I am not putting hypotension. The pressures may be normal. Collaterals cannot maintain a high pulse pressure because the stroke volume will not be transmitted the percussion waves do not get transmitted. More the collaterals, more the radiofemoral delay, but the pulses will be well present. Femorals are weak due to low pulse pressure rather than due to reduction of the pressures. If you look carefully at the femoral artery pressures, it's got a mean pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury, which is not low at all. But the weak pulses are just caused by low pulse pressure. On the contrary, supravalvar aortic stenosis will have low diastolic pressures because the main factor of baroreceptor resetting is not present. 
So even in the proximal segment, you will have a low diastolic pressure. But in quad patient, it's peculiar to have barrow receptor getting reset, high sympathetic drive that results in high diastolic pressures. Arch gradient, especially a mean gradient in Doppler, is the key to diagnose on echocardiography and we constantly look for diastolic spill. Diastolic spill is significant because sometimes gradients will be very low if there are some reasons like LV dysfunction or a patent ductus arteriosus. Some of the common reasons for low gradient conditions will include extensive collaterals, aortic regurgitation, left ventricular dysfunction, neonate with heart failure, wherein the child is in a shock state, large PD. We need to remember sometimes proximal obstructing mitral stenosis, sub AS or AS. Post capillary pulmonary hypertension is also another proximal obstruction. Not only univentricular heart, but in patients who are having non compaction or stable effort angina or ischemic cardiomyopathy, in them even a 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury becomes significant. Post Norwood stage 2, this is a hypoplastic left heart syndrome which has been reconstructed. You can identify the neo iota here, a combination of ascending iota and main pulmonary artery after a stencil anastomosis, significant population being stented. Postenotic dilatation is quite common. Neither the surgeons nor the interventionists track, try to tackle this postenotic dilatation. It is part of the disease unless this postenotic dilatation exceeds beyond five to five and a half centimeter to challenge the Laplace law and stand as a risk of rupture. We need to identify whether it is a discrete coarctation or is it extending into the isthmus or whether it is extending into the transverse arch to decide about the modalities of treatment. We need to understand coarctation is very commonly missed in echocardiography. They may present as low velocity abdominal aortic Doppler, unexplained mitral regurgitation with a high velocity MRJ exceeding five meter per second. Mild flow gradients, turbulence in the mitral valve and aortic valve, bicuspid aortic valve, unexplained LV dilatation, hypertrophy, dysfunction, or unexplained pulmonary hypertension. Imaging plays a major role, especially in grown up patients. Echo will be really good to identify in neonates, infants, and small children. The new modes of imaging, like MR, also look at architecture and computational flow dynamics to find out the jet effect of the coarctation on the descending thoracic iota. We need to know that along with the MR and CT, the tool that is available with us is rotational angiography, which can be used to completely reconstruct the iota. And this reconstructed iota will be useful in planning the interventions as well. Coming to the management when to intervene. The standard indication, systolic gradient of more than 20 millimeters of mercury between the ascending iota and descending iota, or for clinical purposes, between the upper arm and the leg. But sometimes we accept a low gradient coarctation with severe LV dysfunction, large PDA, massive collaterals, or pseudo -coarctation. Stenting versus balloon dilatation. Stenting has got the distinct advantage of tacking the dissections. Preventing aneurysms, most commonly it completely eliminates the gradients. Then why not stent all the coarctations? Growth of iota continues up to 14 to 18 years. And so if you are putting in a stent in a smaller child, it needs redilatation. So we need to put in redilatable stents. In discrete coarctation with good sized isthmus, we may get excellent results with ballooning alone. But if there is an isthmus or transverse arch coarctation, then stenting has to be done. Balloon angioplasty is done when there is a discrete coarctation, taking a balloon to two to three times the coarctation diameter or sometimes matched with the adjacent normal iota either at the arch level or at the isthmic level. There is a question about whether to use a high profile balloon or a low profile balloon. In general, now we try to use a low profile balloon because Sheet size is low and the vascular injury is low. But we need to understand that balloon angioplasty in coarctation works by therapeutic tab. 
the difference between aorta and pulmonary artery is pulmonary artery is far more elastic than aorta so this results in pulmonary arteries being stretched even when you try to dilate three to four times the diameter but they will recoil you cannot reliably tear a pulmonary artery but aorta can be torn you need a therapeutic tear for balloon angioplasty to work jim lock says yeah, unless you get a therapeutic tear that means the luminal irregularity at the end of the procedure the vessel might recoil within a very short period so the issues about balloon angioplasty is primarily on this therapeutic tears which do give the risk of aneurysm it has been found that anywhere between 4 to 8 percent of the patients may develop aneurysms two issues about doing a balloon dilatation in extremely young infants or in newborn babies will be a high risk of restenosis due to the ductal tissue which in older literature was as high as 80 percent and a high incidence of vascular injury which is by and large reduced by low profile balloons and today's neonatal or early infantile less than two months restenosis may hover around 40 percent infantile coaptations when you are doing a balloon dilatation you aim at creating a therapeutic tear. You resort to this only when there is a left ventricular severe systolic dysfunction that makes the child become unstable to go for a general anesthesia. And you find that within a very short period, there is a marked improvement of the left ventricular function. And so if this child gets a recoaptation at two months of three months with a preserved left ventricular function, the surgeon still can go in and do a corrective procedure. So the coaptation in neonates and young infants, surgery remains the gold standard unless you have very severe LV dysfunction to be presenting in cardiogenic shock, multi-organ failure, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, anuria, grossly syndromic children, ventilated and septic children, massively dilated heart, severe LV dysfunction, definitely a transient balloon dilatation is a better option. And then when the child develops a recoaptation, you can always give it to the surgeon. Procedural failure in young neonates is being tackled experimentally by a few attempts. Growth stents, which are basically stents that are longitudinally cut and micro sutured so that it can be broken at a later date. Magnesium stents, which dissolve out but the problem was rapid absorption of this magnesium resulted in rapid restenosis. A good amount of work is being done on bioabsorbable poly L lactic acid and polyglycolic acid stents, which have added biodegradable polymer and added drug dilution as well. There was a talk in the previous, uh, there was a question in the previous talk about drug dilution. The amount of drug that is eluted by a drug eluting stunt is very predictable. We have done serolimus levels in neonates who are undergoing a drug eluting stent. We have identified that a single drug eluting stent of a third generation, if it is deployed to a diameter of 4 millimeter and up to 22 millimeter, it does not cross 5 nanogram per ml within the first 24 hours. The reason why this 5 nanogram per ml is of critical importance is 5 to 15 nanogram per ml is the therapeutic immunosuppressive dose for a child and a newborn if it is given for some therapeutic reasons without causing gross clinical toxicity. If it is more than 15 nanogram, it produces clinical toxicity. If it is between 5 to 15 nanograms, it produces the desired therapeutic effect. For example, a coronary allograft vasculopathy in a small baby who has undergone heart transplant for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. A large rhabdomyoma that needs serolimus. Large other tumors that need serolimus. Wherein you want an immunosuppressive dose 5 to 15 nanogram. And if you are using a stent of less than 4 millimeter, 4 millimeter into 22 millimeter, the amount of drug levels are less than 5 nanograms per ml within the first 24 hours. Paper is under, manuscript is under editorial review by a pediatric journal. Life tech ion stents where Masni Alvi does a lot of work, all are process of evolution. Our policy is ballooning, if a child is more than 3 years, balloon has reasonably good results. 
in children who are less than three years, surgery and balloon will be almost having similar results. In babies who are less than two months, definitely surgery is preferred unless they are of extremely high risk. But currently released guidelines are far more liberal for interventions. I'm just highlighting the two lines. Children who are less than 25 kilograms, that means they are not infants, they are more than 12 months, but they are less than 25 kilograms. And if they have a native cooptation, balloon angioplasty becomes class one indication. It's an Indian recommendation, of course. And surgery becomes the class two A indication. So ballooning is given a higher recommendation than surgery. If you are having a child who is beyond infancy, till you are 25 kilograms. And children more than 25 kilograms are in adults who are having native cooperation. Stenting is given a recommendation of class 2A. Since this procedure carries a risk, as well surgery also carries a risk. Considering the risks of intervening in a patient with a cooperation who is more than 25 kilograms, there is no recommendation given for surgery at all. But still, stenting is given a class 2A recommendation. This is the recently published Indian guidelines. Coming to stenting, we are coming to the end. Typical scenario will be a discrete coarctation in a grown-up patient where the method of choice is obviously not a simple balloon dilatation, but a stent because we want a complete resolution of the gradient and we want to tack up all the dissections. The balloon in balloon, which gives the advantage of stability and a stent mounted over the balloon in balloon, with careful inflation of the inner balloon, then checking the position, and then finally inflating the outer balloon. So this represents the simple standard procedure of a coarctation. Newer techniques that are followed are adopting marker pigtail, identifying markers, keeping markers on the surface of the chest to ensure where is the relative position of the coarctation, using rapid stenting to avoid stent mobility and deploying stents that so that you prevent movement of the stents. More complex tortuosities obviously need covered stenting because when you try to do a dilatation beyond three and a half times of the native diameter, extremely high chance of aortic rupture that you do a covered stent implantation. This is a covered CP stent on a big balloon with a control angiogram that is given from the radial axis pigtail and you have a very predictable result of complete resolution of the gradients. Very tight lesions which are almost like near interruptions. Sometimes you may have to come from the top, pass a guide wire, snare it down and then finally do the procedure wherein again it will be a using a covered stent. Such near interruptions always need cover stents. When you are having a complete interruption of the iota, wherein there is no blood flow between the upper and lower limb, you may have to use a chronic total occlusion coronary wire, or sometimes from below, you may have to use a targeted broken brow needle, which has been straightened, you enter into the upper chamber, and then try to snare the system, and then get the stent in position. Once again, we need to be careful in putting in a yeah, covered stent. Message in native coarctation, if there is an ischemic hypoplasia or transverse arch hypoplasia, stenting is the only reliable way of relieving the gradients. In older patients where somatic growth is nearly complete, stenting is completely preferred even in discrete coarctation where balloon angioplasty and the residual tears are unacceptable. Whenever you want to dilate the coarctation more than three and a half times in a small child, use a covered stent. Covered stent is preferred in any patient due to its safety profile. Is there a role in younger children for stenting? If you have a very resistant lesion to balloon dilatation, if you have isthmic hypoplasia or transverse arch hypoplasia or extremely tight lesions. This is a three-year-old child after a failed balloon angioplasty. The child has, the, the, after a failed surgery, I mean, surgical recooperation. So you are, you are doing a stenting in even a very small child of three years. Whenever you are having a transverse arch hypoplasia, this is a transverse arch hypoplasia in a 15 year old child. So you may have to use a stenting because this never works with balloon. 
obviously whenever it is a transverse arch stenting across the region of the uh, arch vessels you have to mandatorily use only a bare metal stent precoaptation in a 3 year old child again post subclavian aortoplasty it's a significant restenosis which fails when when whenever the compliance testing of this particular lesion indicates that this lesion is highly resistant then you may have to go for a yeah, stent angioplasty what are the problems major problems are balloon rupture stent malposition or aortic rupture a patient with a transposition of great arteries post arterial switch and post arch repair we can identify that when we are putting in the stent as we are opening the stent the rigidness of the metal clips that are around is making this balloon get ruptured and you have a partially deployed stent which is with a with a ruptured balloon you may have to use a low profile balloon to cross through that partially deployed stent redilate it and then finally dilate it to the desired diameter so that you get a yeah, final achieving the final final uh, luminal diameter that you desired reason for balloon ruptures are extremely non compliant lesions so this is after the final dilatation balloon rupture may happen in about 2.3% of the patients if their lesions are extremely rigid migration is another problem migration is commonly due to stents that are mounted by us in the cath lab and not by the stents that are company mounted or in other words pre mounted stents rarely migrate and you can identify that when the stent is being deployed the stent melon seeds and the balloon comes out so this situation you may have to use a smaller profile balloon to cross the lesion and take the sheet as close as possible so that when you are inflating the proximal end and pulling it back you don't pull it back beyond the coarctation by keeping the sheet exactly at immediately below the level of coarctation so that you don't have a stent that comes down into the descending parasitoidal strategies to prevent stent migration that is commonly used now will be right ventricular phase tips in younger children in most recoaptation if ballooning is not giving good hemodynamic result be liberal to stent use large post dilatable stents i won't say formula or valio is a perfect ideal stent they have been proven to go on to 12 to 14 mm but only time will tell whether they can be dilated to 16 to 18 mm we can always say that we can have an initial stent of 14 mm and then finally put in another covered stent and try to dilate and break the previous formula but till we know a really long term results of formula and valio i would still say we have to use one of the conventional mounted not the pre mounted stents where hand mounted stents we may have to use in univentricular hearts try to be more liberal with stent pre stent balloon dilatation is very rarely needed but you may have to do it to check the compliance in post surgical patients high pressure balloon may be needed in post operative non compliant aorta rapid rv pacing and big balloons prevent stent migration covered stents are used whenever you have a chance of rupture and be liberal in using covered stents and in younger children with a recoaptation don't hesitate to use the stent to summarize coaptation is a problem that needs lifelong follow up we may dilate we may stent we may do surgery but lots of changes may happen in the aorta over a period of time stenting has become increasingly an acceptable option balloon angioplasty in newborns there is a role in sick newborns discrete coaptation in younger children result of ballooning is almost equal to surgery that indian guidelines do recommend balloon as a class 1 recommendation now if you are more than 12 months of age be aware about all the problems that can happen in stenting and how to rescue these patients thank you very much uh sir we have uh, dr babar dr amitabh dr neeraj like with questions so dr siva this was an excellent talk can you hear me yeah i can i can hear you very well okay so this was excellent and thank you very much for sharing your experience this is babar hasan from pakistan 
Um, I have a couple of questions. In fact, some of the uh, questions that were coming in the chat also kind of align with those. So there was a question about, about rotational angiography. Uh, do you have a protocol, how much contrast, how much, uh, you know, for different weights and stuff? And then in the same uh, flow, uh, have you looked at the amount of radiation that is given to a child in rotational angiography? And, and if you have a good CT beforehand, is it really necessary to do a rotational angiography? Yeah, rotational angiography has got the advantage that you can perform it on table. The standard way of doing a rotational angiography is to have a 2 is to 1 dilation, dilution of contrast with normal saline. And you have to use a volume of anywhere between 75 to 90 ml in an adolescent. You can go up to around 3 ml per kilogram of the actual contrast dose in a smaller child. And how the rotation planned, nowadays the rotations are 210 degree and they are completed in 4.5 seconds. You need to start the injection about one second prior to your acquisition. So you have to have a 5.5 second in injection and a 4.5 second acquisition. The advantage is that there is an instantaneous roadmap that is created and this roadmap will be overlaying on your fluoroscopic screen. So from then onwards, there is no need for any contrast. Subsequently, the next work will be keeping the roadmap and continuing to progress with the positioning of the sheep, positioning of the stent, and positioning, final checks, all are keeping on being done only with the roadmap. There is a distinct advantage of doing a prior CT scan as well. Now, if you have a heart navigator or a vessel navigator, wherein you can incorporate the CT onto the fluoroscopic screen, that integration is going to help us in the same way like how a 3D rotational roadmap and the overlay of the roadmap is going to help. So we can have either a CT overlay or a rotational uh, angiographic overlay. Since subsequent contrast doses are avoided, the initial 3 ml per kilogram of contrast which has been diluted to 2 is to 1. So it almost comes to 4.5 ml per kilogram of the total volume still will be acceptable because you will be doing only a final angiogram after the stent is fully across, after the guide wire, just prior to guide wire coming up. What is the rate you are keeping for injection in case of rotational angiogram? The rate of okay. injection. Okay. So the rate of five second. The, the rate of injection depends on your catheter. In general, four French pigtail is 12 ml per second. Five French pigtail is 15 ml per second. Six French pigtail is 18 ml per second. So the, the, it depends on the age group at which you are doing. The reason why I'm telling that is in some of the very young babies with pulmonary artery stenosis where you may be doing this, you may be doing in four French catheters and in them, it may be 12 ml per second. So your, your rate of injection depends on the size of the pigtail. The, in a grown-up adult where you are putting a six French pigtail, the largest uh, injectable dose will be 18 ml per second. So, uh, have, yeah, Kannan has got a question. Uh, not question. Uh, there are a lot of comments in the uh, chat box. Uh, yeah. uh, I thought of this. Uh, there was some question. In neonatal coactation, can we use the ballooning as the bridge? He has very clearly told that the primary indication is surgery. If we don't have the surgeon available, and if it's a discrete coactation, balloon might help. If it is a kind of uh, arch hypoplasia, then we have to go to for the stenting, which he has told already. There is one peculiar question. If you put a bare metal stent and if there is a dissection, will you put a covered stent into it? Um, be uh, sure you can answer whether is there any kind of you know, putting a stent and then getting the dissection. Yeah, Maybe usually these are, these are like nightmares that has been created. You have, crea you have done a bare metal stenting and you have created a yeah, a rupture of the aorta and there is an extravasation of the blood outside the aortic lumen and so in these patients it is a, a very urgent resort to a covered stent that is available so in such a condition what you need to do is try to take a very low profile balloon of a larger diameter than what you have used for example if you have stented previously with a 14 or 16 millimeter balloon take an 18 millimeter tie shack balloon Take it across the stented region where there is an extravasation, inflate it to about 1.5 to 2 uh, atmospheres and keep it there. The moment you have kept it there,
try to use an ultrasound guided vascular access on the contralateral groin and advance a sheet and get in a larger sheet through the contralateral groin and then you prepare yourself for getting a covered stent to be ready and the moment you are ready to cross the previous stent transiently deflate the tishak balloon get your coronary uh, get your uh, catheter across the stent into the proximal aorta and reinflate the tishak balloon the moment you have a guide wire you have a catheter in place exchange it into an amplat super stiff guide wire and the moment the guide wire is fully in place then you keep advancing the stent till the lower end of the tishak balloon the moment the stent reaches the lower end of the tishak balloon then immediately cross the lesion with like deflate the tishak balloon cross the lesion and quickly deploy it so it is like a dire emergency and you need you need people like two or three people acting simultaneously at this time because one person maintains the inflation of the proximal tishak balloon to prevent a further and further bleed and the second person keeps working on mounting the stent the third person tries to get an ultrasound guided contralateral vascular access excellent you are now the question yeah the question was what should be the size of the covered stent should it be larger than the original stent or should be the same size of the original diameter of the stent it needs to be at least the same like the original stent if not marginally larger right if stent is not there on shelf which may happen then how much time we can get till we ship to the surgical table usually usually it will be very disastrous because what we will be what we will be tampon adding will be only the proximal entry port and not the distal entry port the distal entry port will continue to bleed substantially into the mediastinum and so you may have to have uh, a yeah, covered stent on on uh, in the lab uh, i would i would like to say today it is completely unacceptable not to have a covered stent in the cath lab and you trying to do a corporation stent it's it's it is it is going to be lethal if there is a, a rare instance of a bare metal stent getting into an aortic rupture see uh, we have seen dr jayarangana the doing coagulation stenting even near total coagulation occlusion with bare metal stent he claimed that uh, it is very very rare do we have jayarangana there to comment on that no he is not there actually i totally agree with shiva that uh, yes. we should have a covered stent in the shelf then you are dealing with uh, aortic coagulation it's absolutely mandatory now and uh, there is no question of compromise on that correct i have to accept on that and there is a question what is the role of percros do we routinely use it because we will be using 11 or 12 front sheets in arteries so do we use the percros or all of us are going only by compressions and uh, kind of uh, uh, getting the uh, bleeding stop i don't know i don't know about others but i give manual compression it's quite often if the if the sheet exceeds 10 french it will be most of the time the initial few minutes of the pressure will be given by me and subsequently given by one of my very very senior associate the the issue here will be as as the as it is the rule with any arterial uh, uh, pr pressure you need to be not like just because you have put in your 12 french it doesn't mean that you need to exert a pressure of 40 like huge atmospheres of pressure through your uh, like uh, like uh, the, the the hands with which you are uh, pressing the vessel so you need to just be able to simply obliterate the pulse transiently and then keep looking at the puncture side slowly keep the releasing the uh, the the pressure on the the pressing fingers till you are not seeing a spurt of the blood at the level of the puncture site but still you are able to feel a pulse through and through your palpating fingers so if you are able to maintain this for a longer period of time invariably a 12 or a 14 french sheet they stop bleeding i have never resorted to use of uh, proglides per close may not be enough proglides may be needed and proglides we have not resorted to for fish we have used it only in tavis So what about uh, use the doctor nagesura no we don't use it i follow same what shiva is telling manual compression only we do and we did not get uh, any kind of issue only once i think uh, couple of years back we used it at the care hospital after that i we, we never used it 
two two questions that are interesting for me and that i am going to answer from the chat box number one covered stenting where you have covered the left subclavian artery and then do you want to perforate the subclavian artery and get it get it again becoming patent extremely rare situations we have done that but in general if suppose the coarctation segment is extremely close to the subclavian artery's mouth and if you have got a covered stent across in place and if you try to create a perforation especially if it is a covered cp stent the ptfe tear that you are creating on the region of the subclavian artery will create a larger tear on the region of the larger tear in the ptfe in the region of the coarctation where you have acutely dilated and may result in again a bleed so it is it is to be followed only if the subclavian artery was a little bit away from the coarctation and not extremely close and extra subclavian don't try to cross second if suppose if we still have to do it one of the one of the thing that needs to be done will be you in such cases you need to plan a left radial access prior to the procedure and park a guide wire into the proximal left subclavian artery already that will act as the guide to which you have to direct how to go and perforate most of the covered cp stents or the covered andro stents do not get perforated by a cto coronary guide wire they will need a true broken bro puncture needle so you need to straighten out the broken bro puncture needle take all the precautions target the guide wire that you have already placed on the left radial artery with the tip of the catheter into the proximal subclavian artery and use the use that as the landmark the second question that i liked i will just quote this alone relatively cost effective stents we need to know that india has made its own large vessel stent it's called zephyr it's made in gujarat by sahajanand company it is a stent that can go up to 18 mm it is available in 18 28 38 and 48 we have published it in cat cvi it is a stent that has zero force shortening it's made up of cobalt chromium so it is far more higher radial stress compared to stainless steel stents for example genesis hd or intra stent or uh, pamas so it's a high radial strength no force shortening and it is a hybrid cell design so that you can you can go through side arm side vessels so dr siva this is babar from pakistan i uh, so just want to share some of our experiences that um uh, since our tavi program started uh, the uh, the per close device became cheaper and available so we actually have started doing per close on our large sheet coops and life has become so easy i'm telling you like manual compression and it was a nightmare uh, doing manual compression for a very long time so we actually use the same approach as for tavi uh, in uh, when we are using a, a 12 or a 13 13 pen sheet uh, and then we put per close device and it's really been a huge benefit it makes our life very easy i do agree many countries follow this policy however we have taken out 14 french sheets with manual compression two two more additional technical points that i would like to add we do not reverse the effect of heparin before pulling out the sheets number one number two we don't wait for normalization of the act which means allowing the act to, to come less than 150 before we take out the sheet very often a coarctation standard stenting will take anywhere between 30 minutes to 60 minutes for you to complete and ship the patient out into the recovery room so between 30 to 60 minutes it is our it is our practice to remove a manually a sheet of anywhere between 10 to 14 french with manual compression being given by mostly the senior most of it so i think uh, we are close to the meeting now we need to end the meeting if there are any questions are there any questions uh, sir kk uh, do you have any question uh, no not really i just uh, sorry i had to uh, yeah uh, i think uh, thank you very much i first of all i really appreciate and thank the pcsi uh, actually they uh, uh, agreed that uh, to take the program and we are requesting the companies to give the sponsorship of this program and it's a very big success we never thought that uh, the attendance will go to close to 400 to begin with we thought it is going to be only for 40 to 50 people so we got the blessings from our president of pcsi dr snehal kulkarni 
that's why i request all the speakers the faculty everybody to put the logo of pcsi from tomorrow onwards and uh, today we'll close the session shivkumar thank you very much kk sir and paulo dr madni everybody and tomorrow we are going to have interesting case sessions i would like to i request everybody to share their cases so that we can in a proper manner and then we'll come back tomorrow and see you same time i request kk sir shukumar to be available uh, for the panelist because these are all going to be cases you need to give lot of comments and questions and probably we need to moderate these sessions as well thank you very much if it is okay with you we will end the session yes sir yes sir yes sir. can i close it sir yes yeah sir. thank you